He can stand in front of tomatoes. Yeah, we're always trading off quality wisdom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your, your, your slides are great. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like it is reality. Yeah, so they have to do I can skip some of mine. Yeah. 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 No, the more I read about it, the more I'm sold. So it's like you've got to come. Well, it's, 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 so because I've seen it, I've seen the masses we've made before. That's uh, well, 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 the right balance. Well, well, right balance. well and and getting people just to pull back and say, we have to stop with traffic. So I want to know.
It's a different generation of two. The do is the part of the Okay, so for those of us outside can push forward and probably get a lot faster. You know, it's good to see you. Oh, you sound good. Yeah, I'm going to Thank <laughs> you. 
Microphone B, audio test, microphone B, podium mic test. And a lapel mic test. Lapel mic working. Another podium. D D. Phone A. A is an apple. A test. A. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, does it sound okay? We're um, <clears throat> we're waiting for Senator Peters, but he's on he's on his way, so he'll uh, he'll arrive. Uh, uh, during these first uh, comments, but we want to get uh, going. We've got a busy schedule, so thank you all for coming. I'm David Lamb. I'm director of the Institute for Social Research. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this conference on the 2020 Census, Citizenship, Science, Politics, and Privacy. <clears throat> um, welcome to those who are uh, watching on the live stream. I want everybody to know that we are uh, we are live streaming this and recording it, uh, and it could be possibly pu be published at a later date, so be aware of that. This conference is co-sponsored by the Institute for Social Research and the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Uh, we've got an excellent group of speakers this morning to talk about many aspects of the 2020 census. Um, Senator Peters, as I mentioned, will be arriving shortly, and I'll introduce him uh, a bit later. Uh, but to begin our program, we are honored to have a keynote presentation from Al Fontenot. <clears throat> Al is the Associate Director for Decennial Census Programs at the U.S. Census Bureau, which is an uh, enormous undertaking at uh, this stage of the census cycle. Um, he came to the Census Bureau after retiring from a successful 40-year uh, private sector career, uh, culminating in almost 20 years as president and CEO of several manufacturing companies. Uh, I was enjoying uh, uh, chatting with him about his uh, about his history, uh, sort of after having a whole career and sort of deciding to help with the 2000 census, as, uh, 2010 census, uh, just as a little side thing uh, uh, temporarily. Uh, he has now done virtually everything you can do in the census, and um, including uh, serving as uh, uh, assistant regional director of the Los Angeles region, regional director of the Chicago region, chief of the field division an assistant director of both the field and decennial directorates uh, prior to his uh, becoming the associate director for decennial uh, census programs, which is an uh, enormous job. Uh, so very impressive that he combines this, uh, and I think quite unusual, that he combines this uh, long history uh, in the private sector as, and then uh, doing all of these uh, different uh, positions in the, in the field work of both the American uh, Community Survey and the, uh, and the decennial census. Um, so he's now, uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, his uh, perspectives on how things are going for the 2020 census, so let's welcome Al Fontenot. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. So everyone on this beautiful rainy morning here in Ann Arbor. It's my pleasure to be here today to present an overview of the census. I'm going to be highlighting the innovations we've implemented and the processes and programs 
that we have established to ensure that we conduct a complete and accurate 2020 census. Before we get started, just a brief reminder, you all know this, but we remind everyone in every presentation that the purpose of the census is to conduct the enumeration of the population and housing and disseminate the results of the president, the states, and the American people as mandated in Article I, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. The primary purpose is the apportionment of representation among the states for the House of Representatives. But there are many other important uses of census data, including the drawing congressional state legislative districts, school districts, voting precincts, distributing over $675 billion annually to states and local communities, informing decisions that governments and private sector business makes, businesses make every day, helping them make good decisions about their work. As we think about the census, it's a very complex situation at best, and in this environment, it's even more difficult. We have a series of challenges for the 2020 census, including the fact that response rates for surveys and censuses worldwide are declining. People are more concerned about sharing information and trust of government is also declining. Households are more complex, diverse, and dynamic. Blended families may include two primary residences for the children as they have split families and blended families. Other households may include more than one family or multiple generations. The United States continues to be a highly mobile nation as about 15% of the population moves in any given year. More and more households speak languages other than English as the primary language spoken in that household. The current low employment levels, while they are good for the nation, make it very challenging for us to hire 400,000 temporary census workers that we will need to complete our operation. And in 2020, we will be competing for attention with both the Olympics and the presidential election. This slide provides a snapshot of how we conduct the census. I'd like to provide this overview before getting into the innovations that we have developed and tested throughout this decade. The first thing, starting in the lower left corner, There we go, I think. Over there. <laughs> the lower left corner where it says establish where to count is how we start by building the address list, what we refer to as a master address file. This includes every address in the country and forms the basis for the census. Then we motivate people to respond. This is one of the places where partners are very important to us. People need to know how important their census response is and that their census response is safe. We're counting on our partners to help us get that message out. Self-response will be easier than ever this census. We're going to be providing three modes and multiple languages in which people can respond to the census. As in prior censuses, we also make sure that we're counting and enumerating people who are living or staying in non-traditional housing. In some cases, we call that group quarters. And we'll also provide an opportunity for people experiencing homelessness to be included in the census. Nevertheless, some people will not respond, so we follow up with them by knocking on their door an average of about six times if necessary. Some will be a lot more, some will respond on the first knock. Our partners are helpful in this phase as well because they encourage people to cooperate with our enumerators when they come to their residence. And finally, we tabulate and release the census data, first to the president and then to the country. So now let's dive in a bit so I can tell you how we're doing things differently from previous censuses. The Census Bureau is effectively moving the decennial census into the 21st century by leveraging existing technologies to automate multiple operations and increase efficiencies. This means moving beyond the antiquated paper and pencil approach of 2010 to a modernized, tech-driven approach to achieve a complete and accurate census. This modernization effort applies to multiple aspects of the decennial census in what we call our four key innovation areas. First, re-engineering address canvassing. That's changing the way we build our address list. Second, optimizing self-response, making it quick, easy, and safe for everyone to self-respond. Third, utilizing administrative records, 
and third-party data to reduce respondent burden. That's using information that people have already given the government to reduce the need to go and ask them those same questions over and over again. And for, finally, re-engineering field operations. That's using technology to be more efficient in everything we do to manage those 400,000 people and collect the data that we will be collecting during non-response follow-up operations and during the address canvassing operation. When we say establishing where to count, we mean identifying all the addresses where people do or could live. We'll conduct a 100% review and update of the nation's address list in preparation for the 2020 census. We'll be building on the use of the handheld devices that we pioneered in 2010 in the last census, and we'll use tablets and laptops to verify addresses in the field. By using geospatial imagery to review the nation's addresses, we'll be able to verify approximately 70% of the addresses in our data center instead of verifying all of them by having to walk every street in the nation. In 2010, we walked 11.2 million census blocks to try to verify our address list. We'll be able to save 70% of that activity through geospatial imagery. We'll use multiple data sources to identify areas with address changes, such as postal sequence delivery file, the local government input that we get through LUCA, which is our local update of census addresses program. Incidentally, I just wanted to mention to you that that program so far is in its response phase. We've already gone out and solicited information. We have received responses and updates from state and local governments representing 95% of the housing in the United States. So governments take advantage of LUCA to make sure that their address list is reflected in our master address file. During this phase, we'll also delineate the types of enumeration areas, including those designated what we call update lead, where a census delivers a complete questionnaire packet, including an invitation to respond online, telephone numbers to reach our online center, and a paper questionnaire to housing units in neighborhoods and communities that do not have city-style addresses and also to areas affected by natural disasters. For example, we have designated the entire island of Puerto Rico as update lead, and areas affected by fires, hurricanes, floods, such as California for fires, the Gulf Coast of Florida for hurricane impact. Those will also be handled on update lead basis because they do not have reliable postal, reliable postal delivery, and they do not have city-style addresses still intact in their, address, in their street map. So what we're going to do is the enumerator will go out and leave a packet, and then using the electronic device, get a map spot for where that location is on a longitude and latitude basis. That will help us improve our address list of where people actually are. And then we're going to leverage workload models and technology to efficiently manage and route on-ground staff assignments for infield address canvassing and for non-response follow-up. When we say motivate people to respond, we're talking about two primary areas. First, our nationwide communications and partnership campaign. We are building on the success of using paid advertising in prior censuses. And we're going to focus our communications about the 2020 census using advanced modeling techniques to increase awareness and self-response in those areas that are most likely to be unaware of the benefits that the census data provides for their local community. In addition to our traditional print and broadcast media advertising, for the first time, we'll be able to use focus segmentation to reach specific audience using digital media and digital advertising. Second, but in many ways more important, we motivate people to respond to the census by providing a safe, and secure environment and systems into which they can submit their personal information. And we let them know that their information that they give to the census is safe and confidential. Let me start with what's behind that statement when we say your data is safe with the Census Bureau. We ensure that the respondent, respondent data is safe through the Census Bureau's culture of data stewardship. It's a comprehensive framework designed to protect information over the course of the life cycle. From collection on encrypted secure devices where the data are secured while at rest on the instrument, secured during transmission, 
and encrypted immediately during transmission, where they're secured inside the census firewall, and where we're also protecting that data during the entire stage of processing of the information. And finally, through the 2020 Disclosure Avoidance System, we assure that all data provided on census forms remain confidential in all census publications. Our census design balances data security with user experience. But make no mistake, data security is and continues to be first. We must contain cyber threats as soon as they are detected to protect respondents' data. Then we focus on user experience to sustain response service through any potential cyber issues so respondents may continue to respond. The Census Bureau is working closely with experts from the federal cyber security community led by the Department of Homeland Security and top private industry partners to test, review, and validate our internal and external cybersecurity systems design and process. Communicating what we do to ensure respondents' data are secure and confidential is a vital part of motivating response. People need to know their data, their responses are not just confidential but also secure. This is why we say responding to the census is important, easy, and safe. This is just one of the messages we will be consistently disseminating through our integrated partnership and communications program. Let's look at our integrated partnership and communications program. It consists of many elements, as you can see from the slide. <clears throat> it encompasses both the national <clears throat> and community partnership program. <clears throat> Excuse me. The integrated communication contract and the enterprise communication work done by the census communication directory. The program is designed to design, produce, implement, and monitor an integrated program for the 2020 census. Our contract supports the 2020 mission and provides us with tools and resources to ensure a complete and accurate census in 2020. Young and Rubicam, YNR, are our communications contractor this year and they bring extensive world-class marketing and communications expertise. They bring team leadership, strategy development, dynamic creative development and execution, operational systems, and financial stewardship to the table, making this contract a key component for a successful census. The goal of the Integrated Partnership and Communications Program is to engage and motivate people to self-respond, preferably via the internet and to raise awareness to encourage response throughout the entire 2020 census process, including non-response follow-up. This operation communicates the importance of participating in the 2020 census by supporting field recruitment efforts with a, to get us a diverse and qualified census workforce. They will be working to engage and motivate people to self-respond, preferably via the internet, raising and keeping awareness high throughout the entire 2020 census and effectively supporting dissemination of census data to stakeholders and the public at the completion of the census. It's comprised of many components, but the major components include website and mobile, media relations, paid advertising, statistics in schools, and social media. The mission of the National Partnership Program is to establish relationships with organizations and business entities that have a natural, national reach and scope to get their engagement in leveraging trusted, familiar voices to increase response to the census and to develop sustaining and transformational engagement. Thinking of creative ideas that we, the Census Bureau, may not have thought of, but they, in their corporate marketing and development program, have thought of creative ways to reach people. We're utilizing that to transform some of our communication. The Community Partnership Program is one that most of us are familiar with. It focuses primarily on motivating diverse communities at the local level toward greater participation in the 2020 Census, mobilizing community leaders to be engaged with their constituents and with the Census Bureau for their consistent constituents to understand that that community center across the street, those roads in front of the house, the schools in the neighborhood are all supported because of the data that those constituents provide to the Census Bureau. The census is about the people, not about the government. 
And we also ask our partners to reach out to populations with historically low response rates because we know those are more challenging to count. So how's this done? Three ways. We educate people about the 2020 census. We encourage community partners to motivate people to respond. And thirdly, we engage grassroots organizations to reach out to their constituents who we know have often been more difficult to reach. We'll be hiring 1,500 partnership specialists from local communities to directly work with local governments, communities, organizations, church groups, schools, and libraries to develop an effective local movement, customized with personalized messaging and encouraging self-response in the language that people are familiar with and in the context that people are familiar with in their local communities. We're leveraging trusted voices throughout all elements of the partnership program. As you can see on the, that side of the slide, the right side, of your right side, your left side of the slide, um, we have a number of units and organizations and groups that are key elements of our partnership program, from state complete count commissions, through faith-based organizations, through higher education census on campus, to LGBTQ outreach. We are looking to utilize these organizations as effectively as possible to communicate the census message. The state complete count commission is a new concept for 2020. These state complete count commissions are established by either state legislation, legislature action or by gubernatorial action and are a central and critical component of the partnership program. The higher level of commitment and resources provided by states enhance the efforts to conduct the census and get a complete count. Just as a point of information, the state of California has already committed over $100 million for 2019 and 2020 to complete their state complete count commission's efforts to push the census for their seats. Often in a state, they realize that they could have seats at risk and substantial federal funding at risk. California has made the calculation that this is well worth the investment for them at this time. One of the advantages is the state officials do understand the benefits and impact of the 2020 census and they promote the critical importance of participation at all levels of the government within the state. Our regional staff continue to identify officials at the county, municipal, and community levels to organize complete count committees there to increase awareness about the census and motivate respondents, residents to respond. Complete count committees at the local level will energize local communities and provide more financial and manpower resources for us to implement an effective 2020 census. In our initial stages, we're at the early stages of the complete count committee organization. 38 states have already committed to doing state complete count committees or commissions, and over 500 local organizations have already established local complete count committees. Previous censuses asked the public to respond primarily by mail. We mailed you a questionnaire, you filled it out, you mailed it back. For the first time, the internet will be the primary response option, making it easy for people to respond anytime and anywhere. While we are encouraging people to respond online, we will provide options for people to respond using telephone, paper, questionnaires, in addition to an online option. The use and adaptation of the internet by all sectors of our society led us to design an easy to use internet option that can be used on home computers, at public libraries, and at other public forums. It's designed for all those who use mobile technology, whether it's on their laptops, their tablets, or their smartphones. It enables them to respond wherever you are and wherever you want, whenever you want, with or without your census ID the maximum flexibility to respond online. As we were developing this plan to use innovative technologies to modernize the census, we asked ourselves, what about people who are impacted by the computer literacy gap or on the other side of the digital divide? We don't want to leave people out who don't have access to Wi-Fi or don't have electronic devices. What about people who are not comfortable with using technology or just don't want to put their personal information online? What about those people whose primary language is not English? As we went through this drill of questioning, 
we developed the Census Questionnaire Assistance Centers. These are call centers where people can call toll free. The number will be included in all of our mailings and in our literature. And they can, have one, have a human answer the phone and provide them assistance on how to fill out their form, how to fill out their online. Number two, they can answer any other questions they may have about the census. And number three, they can actually take the interview right over the telephone. So they can take their interview right there. We'll also be sending a questionnaire in the first of our six mailings our invitation to respond to the census to areas that do not have strong internet connectivity and that have households that data tell us are less likely to use the internet. We will be sending a questionnaire, paper questionnaire to those on the initial mailing. On the fourth mailing, which happens about three weeks later, anyone who has not responded to the census will receive a paper questionnaire so people can respond however they choose to do so. One of our goals in connect, conducting the 2020 census is to generate the largest possible self-response, thus reducing the number of households requiring expensive follow-up. We'll motivate everyone by encouraging self-response through micro-targeted advertising, tailored contact strategies, and multiple mailings. As I mentioned previously, what about people whose primary language is not English? Our language program this year is far stronger than it was 10 years ago. We'll be providing an internet response option in 12 languages in addition to English and providing video instructions and guides in 59 additional languages. The agents in our call centers will be fluent and able to take responses in the 13 languages that we will have <coughs> on the internet device, as well as a TD telephone communication device for the deaf. We have another type of enumeration, which we call group quarters enumeration. Group quarters are places where people live or stay in a group living arrangement. These places are owned or managed by an entity or organization providing housing and our services for the residents. The services may include custodial or medical care, as well as other types of assistance, and residency is commonly restricted to those receiving those services. This is not your typical household type, living arrangement. So people living in group quarters are usually not related to each other. Examples of group quarters include nursing facilities, residential treatment centers, college, university, or seminary student housing, correctional facilities, inpatient, inpatient hospice facilities, job course centers, vocational training facilities that have resident capabilities. We also use service-based enumeration as part of this operation to count people who are experiencing homelessness by going to soup kitchens, shelters, outdoor locations, and encampments to attempt to count those people in our census. For the first time, we're going to be using smartphone technology to capture responses in the field. We'll also take advantage of automation to effectively and efficiently manage and route our on-the-ground field staff. Area census offices will rely on automation to collect, manage payroll information, all these things were done in paper in 2010 um, to more efficiently do case assignment, done in paper in 2010, automatically determine the optimal travel routing in 2010. They figured it out on their own, and we drove millions of miles, more than perhaps was necessary. We worked with the United Parcel Service and their routing software to figure out how do we route people in the most efficient manners that allow us to reduce our number of physical offices, and we are testing, we've just finished our 2018 census test, which we ran in Providence, Rhode Island. It was very successful. Our systems, it was a test to determine if our systems could work together and if people could work using those systems. We found it to be extremely effective. And one of the things that we show from the test is we had a 30% increase in productivity with these technological field enhancements. A lot of that was achieved just in shorter routings. Some of it was achieved through the devices and other things that happened to help. But we were able to achieve that, and we were very excited about what that provides us. I want to take just a moment to touch on the use of data that people have already provided the federal government, what we call administrative records. We'll be using data we get from the U.S. Postal Service, the IRS, the Social Security Administration, and other agencies to remove vacant and non-existent addresses from the non-response follow-up workload. And in some cases, we will use records to enumerate households that do not respond to the census. But I want to stress and emphasize that we will only be using those 
in areas where we have a very high confidence in the data of a particular household that that data is accurate and complete. If it's not, as is generally the case in virtually all of our traditionally undercounted populations, we will always send someone to the door to conduct the interview. Using administrative records does enable us to identify millions of vacant and non-existent housing units and reduces the need and cost of multiple visits to knock on doors to identify and verify those units. We'll verify those statuses by sending mailings and receiving multiple undeliverable address returns from the U.S. Post Office, coded vacant, and then we'll check with having a one person go out and verify that those units are actually vacant or non-existent. In 2010, vacant and non-existent housing units accounted for 14.4 million housing units of our non-response follow-up effort. We will have significant savings with that, this approach. And finally, consistent with prior censuses, we'll deliver the apportionment counts to the president and the redistricting counts to the states. We will build upon efforts in recent decades to give the public greater access to the data. We'll provide flexible tools allowing the public to view 2020 census data any way they want. Improvements will include visualizations, easier search functionality, and improved access to data tables and data sets. I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, this concludes my presentation, which I hope you found informative. Feel free to contact us through any of the multiple ways listed here, or I can personally be contacted at A.E. Fontenot at census.gov. I will make one statement. Uh, I have not mentioned the citizenship question. On advice of counsel, since we are in lit litigation at the moment, the only thing I am able to say on that is the Department of Commerce website has defined that the secretary, acting under his authority in Title 13, chose to add the question to the 2020 census. Thank you. <laughs>
First, uh, uh, deals a great deal with the form of government we have and representation. As a as an elected federal official, I can tell you that's incredibly important when it comes uh, to redistricting and to the establishment of our legislative branches. As a member of the Senate, uh, it doesn't matter uh, as much, uh, given the fact that uh, I represent uh, a state uh, and not uh, a district, but uh, I served in the House of Representatives for a number of years, and I can tell you that it makes an incredible uh, difference uh, when it comes uh, to that body. You know, our founders uh, laid the groundwork uh, for American democracy on the vision that the, the U.S. House would basically be the place where every one individual gets uh, one vote. We know that isn't necessarily the case in the Senate when you have small states that have two senators and one House member and places like California that have a whole lot of House members and, and still just two senators as well. But uh, James Madison described the uh, House of Representatives as the legislative body with an immediate dependence on and intimate sympathy with the people. Uh, that's uh, the, the, uh, the goal of uh, that. And it's uh, uh, important to have then districts of equal size and to make sure that we're counting every individual for that. So previous to uh, our founders uh, putting the census in such a, an important role, they have been used to assess taxes, to confiscate property, to draft citizens into the military. Uh, so the idea of a census wasn't new to the founders, but uh, the concept of turning the census into a tool for democracy truly was revolutionary at the time. And while the Constitution is explicit about the census role in democracy, the survey's ramifications, as we heard uh, earlier, uh, stretch well beyond uh, representation in Congress. Information produced by the census is a, a lifeline for communities uh, throughout our state here in, in Michigan and across the nation and uh, impacts everybody's uh, lives in very direct ways. It determines uh, what communities get in terms of federal funding for highway projects, for police and fire department personnel, Medicare and Medicaid, for seniors, children working families who rely on quality care, and programs like Head Start that provide uh, education for our children. But giving uh, government programs, as all of you know, are not the only ones that uh, rely on this census data. Inaccurate counts will also impact the decisions in private industry that use the census as to where to locate offices and where to recruit uh, people, and the list goes on in, in private industry. And there are even less tangible but uh, equally important uh, implications for its census data. For example, since individuals of Middle East and North African descent do not have a designated uh, category in the census. Uh, they are not eligible for protection under Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, which ensures, uh, among other things, the availability of foreign language ballots. Researchers also use census data to monitor uh, everything from health disparities among specific populations to employment dis uh, discrimination. Uh, this is uh, important uh, research information for us to create a more equitable society. The census uh, is uh, without question, and I'm preaching to the choir here, I know, uh, it's a source of uh, valuable information. But I think today, and what is the importance of this symposium today, and, and what we're going to be hearing in the hours ahead, is to recognize that the risk uh, and the challenges the Census Bureau now faces less than two years away from 2020 are, are significant. Uh, the security and integrity of the census collection tools and resulting data is paramount to, to a successful survey. But since 2010, the risk and threats uh, from our cyber infra or to our cyber uh, infrastructure have grown exponentially uh, across both the private sector uh, and federal government. And whether it's uh, cyber criminals uh, assessing troves of customer data from Target uh, and Equifax or foreign governments like China stealing personal information of uh, federal employees, uh, the threats are certainly very real, and the risks are very great. And while the Census Bureau is certainly making progress in its preparedness, as uh, we heard from the previous uh, speaker, security vulnerabilities have not uh, been mitigated uh, sufficiently in my mind. And as a member of the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee and the Senate uh, Commerce Committee, uh, both committees have uh, jurisdiction over the census as well as jurisdiction over cybersecurity in the country. And as a member of these committees, I've joined my colleagues uh, to exert some influence uh, over uh, the census planning uh, and execution uh, for the 2020 uh, census. I uh, recently joined uh, seven of my colleagues in requesting that the Government uh, Accountability Office assess the IT security and readiness of, of uh, census uh, systems. 
uh, without question, a breach of Americans' uh, personal information would be absolutely disastrous, uh, but it could also have a lasting impact on the integrity of the census for years to come by sowing distrust and discouraging response rates. Earlier this year, the general uh, GAO identified over 3,000 security vulnerabilities, and unless the Bureau can address them in a timely manner, the reality is that this critical survey remains vulnerable to those who would do us harm. As GAO continues to monitor the uh, security challenges surrounding the census, I'm going to be working with both Republicans uh, and Democrats uh, in Congress to help make sure that uh, Americans' personal information is indeed uh, secure. And maintaining the integrity of the uh, census uh, is paramount, and we must resist, uh, and this is critical, resist efforts to use it as a political tool. Like many people, I'm very concerned by Secretary Ross's abrupt decision and continued insistence on adding an untested question about citizenship that will likely impact the accuracy and the cost of the survey. Not only will the Census Bureau employees have to travel to communities for in-person follow-up, a significant investment of time and taxpayer money, but adding the citizenship question in such a troubling way I think serves uh, to spread the mistrust that we need to uh, try to mitigate. As many of, of you uh, know, uh, six lawsuits have been filed to prevent the citizenship question from being added to the 2020 census. The largest of these lawsuits is New York uh, versus the Commerce Department. Documents filed by the Commerce Department in this case uh, provide compelling evidence that the stated reason for adding the citizenship question which was that the Justice Department needs the data to properly enforce the Voting Rights Act, uh, was merely a cover for what appears to be purely political motivations. The fact that the White House is fighting to delay the trial, knowing that initial testing and preparations for the census are well underway, is unsettling, to say the least. And there are continued attempts to permanently block lower court orders allowing Secretary Ross to be questioned illustrates their fear that the truth may come out and they will be shown to have acted in bad faith. When juxtaposed with the Bureau's failure to include a Middle East, North African, or MENA designation, despite years of intensive uh, research uh, and community engagement, I'm disappointed that this inconsistent use of trusted survey methods. Even minor changes to the Senate census forms can have a significant impact on response rates, undermining data accuracy and increasing the overall cost of it as well. Typically, even small proposed changes to the census go through extensive research and testing consistent with statistical analysis provisions and principles in order to account for unintended consequences. In March, uh, I joined my colleagues in introducing legislation that will protect the accuracy of the census and ensure any proposed changes to the current, uh, to the count, are properly studied, researched, and tested. Pretty radical concept, I understand. Among other provisions, uh, the bill prevents the Secretary of Commerce from imp implementing major operational changes that have not been researched and tested for at least three years prior to the census. With the census at such a critical juncture, I have been very vocal in pushing the President to quickly nominate a new Census Bureau director. It's extremely important that a nonpartisan entity like the Census Bureau have a nonpartisan, experienced, and scientifically qualified public servant at the helm. After leaving the position vacant for a year, President Trump nominated David Dillingham to be the Census Bureau director. I've had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Dillingham uh, in my office. Uh, and a few, a few weeks ago and discussed what I think should be priorities that uh, he should pursue if confirmed. And I called on him to take action uh, to earn public trust in the census, uh, in, even in this current political environment that is, uh, let's say, filled with discord and uncertainty. I urged him to recognize which actions have been taken or what decisions have been made that may have contributed to a lack of trust in the census. That means being honest about the potential impacts of the citizenship question and trying to educate the public to how they can separate fact from fiction. 
a very big topic in today's political environment. Everyone should feel confident that the information the census collects as part of this critical effort will not be misused, mishandled, or manipulated in any way. We all must recognize our role in the education of the public to contribute to a successful survey central to the economic and social well-being of our country. And that's why uh, it is so important to what you are all discussing uh, today. I hope that these discussions are, are uh, informative and productive, and I look forward to hearing what comes out of this uh, very important symposium. So thank you for what you're doing. It is now uh, my, my uh, honor to welcome Jeff uh, Morenoff, who is the director of the Populations uh, Study Center, uh, who will moderate this morning's panel on citizenship and politics. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Senator Peters, and happy Halloween, everyone. Um, I think we, he's given us a few reasons to be potentially scared about the future of the census, uh, security questions, which we'll deal with on the second panel, but also this, the, the issue of citizenship, which we're going to deal with on this panel. So actually, at this time, I'd like to have the panelists come up and uh, have their seats, and I'm going to give more lengthy introductions of each one by one as they as they uh, approach the podium. But uh, this is a really great panel that we have for you this morning on citizenship and politics um, that consists of three people who I count among my closest friends in academia and one that I have not met yet, who I'm anxious to meet. Um, the first will be Barbara Anderson, uh, who um, I'll, I'll introduce in a second, followed by Jim House, Angela Ocampo, and then Kurt Metzger. Uh, let me just say a few words about Barbara. So Barbara is the Ronald A. Friedman Collegiate Professor of Sociology and Population Studies at the University of Michigan. Um, her research and teaching centers on the relationship between social change and demographic change, and as, as well as the area of technical demography. And um, one of the reasons that Barbara is on this panel, in addition to her lengthy career and expertise in this area, is that she was recently the chair of the Census Bureau of Sci the Census Bureau Scientific Advisory council or panel and uh, recently left that position. I'm going to leave it to her to explain the terms under which she left. But hint, it has to do with the citizenship question. So take it away, Barbara. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I don't see. Anderson one. Okay. I think it was underneath something. Oh, there it is. Up there. Okay. There. Hi, thank you um, so much. Um, as Jeff was saying, I was uh, a member of the Census Scientific Advisory Committee, which is a congressionally mandated committee. Um, which is whose purpose is to give the best advice possible to the director of the Census Bureau. I was a member for seven years, and I was chair for three years. And after being led to believe I'd be reappointed, I was not, and my term finished August 15th. On the one hand, when I was a member, I was officially a special federal government employee and was under some restrictions about what I could say in public. And now I'm not on the committee, but now I can say anything I want. As Al was, uh, was saying, if you're um, a regular Census Bureau employee, at least, you can't say anything about policy because it's to stay um, non, um, nonpartisan. The um, Secretary Ross announced the citizenship question on Tuesday, March 27th, and our spring meeting convened on Thursday, March 29th. After each uh, meeting, we um, submit an official list of comments and recommendations to the Census Bureau director, which we did. And in March, about half of our comments and questions related to the citizenship question. And if we look at these, these uh, summarize concerns essentially all of which were 
talked about in our official comments. It's, and I think that really everybody on the committee would agree with what I'm saying here. This was not controversial within the committee. Uh, it's likely to depress census response, especially among immigrants and undocumented, undocumented persons. It's likely to discourage cooperation with the census by potential community partner organizations. These community partner organizations, which Al meant talked about, are very important. For the 2000 census, the INS, which now is replaced by Homeland Security, suspended all raids for the months around the census to encourage response. In 2010, the raids kept on, but they also set up a program of cooperation with community partners. And for 2010, there were about a quarter of a million community partners that were enlisted, and it was extremely um, successful. From what we know, from even from the um, Freedom of Information Act obtained focus groups from the Providence Rhode Island test, it is very likely that cooperation of community partners will be much more difficult in the 2020 census, mainly or overwhelmingly because of the citizenship question. These things will lead to a more expensive and lower quality census. It will be more expensive because it doesn't cost much if everybody self-responds. What's really expensive is sending people out to talk to people. And you're going to have to do a lot more of this. It'll be much less successful. And it's going to be more expensive. And it's going to be a lower quality census because you're almost certain to have um, a much higher undercount, a much lower response rate. The 2010 effort was quite successful. I mean, the community partners were great, uh, and it really uh, worked. Survey research has shown that the Census Bureau has an excellent, excellent public reputation, which is not true of Census Bureaus in all countries. But the citizenship question is likely to severely damage that reputation and increase distrust of the purposes of all U.S. federal government data collection efforts. And I don't know how long it's going to take to, uh, to heal that. Now, to talk about a little bit of history, this is not the first time there have been political concerns related to a census. To go back in history a little bit, and students I teach know I do this all the time. Between 1910 and 1920, the United States became much more urban. There was a large migration from heavily rural states to heavily urban states. So this would have, in the normal course of affairs, led to a reapportionment of seats in the House of Representatives with a substantial shift in those seats from the more rural areas to the newly, or to the more urban areas. Um, but members of Congress from rural states repeatedly blocked in the 1920s, reapportionment efforts based on the 1920 census. And this situation wasn't remedied until in 1929, a bill was passed which mandated reapportionment after the 1930 census and mandated automatic reapportionment um, after each successive census, even though the 1920 census was a normal <coughs> census. So we've been to these political waters before. If we look at World War I and World War II, in World War I, the census gave the, well, provided the other parts of the government with names and addresses of draft age males on an individual basis. And in World War II, it got worse. The um, United States government used 1940 individual census data to identify Japanese American households for internment. This was legal at the time due to the War Powers Act of 1941. So what they did was, not nice, but it was legal then. In 1978, a law was passed prohibiting sharing personal information with other government agencies for at least 78 years after data collection. And this is related to when the census data become public for research and such. <coughs> also, the German census and German government has had problems. The 1983 German census was suspended 
during, due to alarm over transfer of individual religion data to other German databases. People were really agitated. And the German court ruled that this was illegal, that it could not be done under German law without individual permission. Uh, in, the next, in the 1987 attempt at a census, there were extensive protests because even though there were these new legal assurances, the, there was substantial distrust among the German population about the privacy provisions in the German, 1987 German census and over personal questions that were on the census, especially the request for the name of the employer. The next census in Germany wasn't until 2011, so there was a big hi hiatus in that. And it was based on population register data in combination, not with a whole census, but with a 10% population survey. As many of you know, through 2000, there was a long form and a short form for the US census. About one sixth of households received the long form, which had about 60 questions. The American Community Survey, which also had about 60 questions, we placed the long census form in 2010. The ACS surveys about 3 million households each year, and these, the data collected throughout the year. Um, but the ACS, by law, cannot be used for congressional reapportionment, for reallocating members of the House of Representatives. The ACS, however, is used for substantial allocation of federal government funds related to poverty status, and a lot of other conditions. Um, the ACS does ask a question about citizenship, and this has been almost totally non-controversial. It's asked of this sample, and it's fine, and all that. And that uh, is what's used for work related to enforcement of the Voting uh, Rights Act. So one comes to a question I'm allowed to talk about policy and politics now, so I will. Why add a citizenship question to the census? Wilbur Ross stated that the reason was to improve enforcement of the Voting Rights Act, which this administration has not showed an extremely large amount of concern to date. But um, you could make Sure, any question you ask on the whole census, you're going to have better, more detailed data. But you could make almost as good an argument for almost all of the 60 questions on uh, the ACS. And the Census Bureau made an official reply to the Justice Department and to Secretary Ross um, showing how ACS data, if they really wanted to do a better job enforcing the Voting Rights Act, that you could use the data from the ACS, you could use estimation to make quite good estimates for everywhere um, else, uh, if that were exactly uh, actually what they uh, wanted to um, do. The, I thought about why in the world are they doing this? I mean, if they just wanted to depress response, especially among underrepresented and minority populations, there are a variety of easier, less controversial ways they could have achieved that purpose. So I scratched, scratched, scratched my head, and maybe I was kind of slow, but it was only a few weeks ago that I came to the conclusion, which I am like 95% certain of, that the purpose of adding the citizenship question is to lay, and I've talked to other people who don't think I'm crazy, was to lay the groundwork to change the whole basis for state legislative uh, districts within states and for reapportionment of seats in the House of Representatives from being a basis of the total population to being a basis of the citizen voting age population. Now some people, many people, think this would be unconstitutional, but there is a non-trivial, although minority, uh, body of legal thought that says this would not be unconstitutional. It would go to the Supreme Court and who knows what would happen there. Um, to give you a little more history, in um, 19, excuse me, I should have said uh, 2016, I had the wrong title, it wasn't 19, 2000, I never claimed to be perfect. 
In 2000, you know, you read it a million times, you don't find all your mistakes. In 2016, two Texans sued the state of Texas because they wanted Texas legislative districts to be changed to being allocated based on the number of people eligible to vote rather than on the total population. And Texas had done this the standard way based on the total population. The Supreme Court unanimously decided that allocation by the state of Texas based on the total population was legal. But they did not address the question of whether uh, a law changing the allocation to the number of adult citizens would be legal or not. And at the time, Justices Alito and Thomas stated that they um, did not think that allocation, if there is such a law, based on the eligible voter population for districts would be illegal. In 2015, I got the century right there at least, Lee Labresco argued on, in 538 that districts based, this idea has been knocking around for quite a while, based on persons eligible to vote could not be drawn because we don't have the information, or we didn't until maybe now, um, on the citizen voting age population. The planned citizenship question would provide that information for the entire population. I also wanted to comment that what Al said was totally well, correct, which is not a surprise. He's a really good guy. Um, that Wilbur Ross clearly had the legal authority on his own to add the citizenship question so that he did not violate any law. However, no, they, he, he or she can do that on their own. However, no earlier uh, Secretary of Commerce had acted in that way. Now, by law, as I said before, the ACS data cannot be used for reapportionment of seats in the House of Representatives. So estimates of the number of citizens by, for the whole population based on the ACS um, could not be used for this reallocation enterprise. Another reason that the ACS data could not be used is there have been various court cases about adjusting the census count use what's called, using what's called statistical estimation and estimating the undercount overall and putting people back in. It seems to me that if the ACS were used to estimate the number of citizens by, for the total population, that would almost certainly get knocked down legally on the same kind of basis of why statistical estimation was uh, not used. For some last thoughts, it's clear that the census has to count all people, but there's a legal controversy, as I was mentioning, about whether all people must be the basis for state legislative districts or for allocations of seats in the House of Representatives. Such a law for either this within states or for members of Congress, distribution among states of members of Congress, would certainly go to the Supreme Court, but especially with the current Supreme Court, it's unclear what the, how the Supreme Court would rule. This kind of change would certainly would lead to less attention of needs of children and non-citizens. It doesn't just restrict it to citizens, but it doesn't count people who are minor children under age 18. It will decrease the influence of these. It also would increase the influence of states with a relatively old population. The, um, According to an analysis by the demographer uh, Andrew Beveridge in 2016, at that time, and I don't think it's changed much in two years, uh, a voting age citizen basis would shift about five congressional seats from Democratic to Republican, which is at least something which you all might be interested in knowing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I should have mentioned at the outset that we're going to take whoops, we're going to take questions after all the speakers have finished, but there will be time for questions.
So uh, our next speaker is Jim House. Jim is the Angus Campbell Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of Survey Research, Public Policy, and Sociology. Uh, Jim has conducted extensive research in the areas of social psychology, as well as the social and psychological determinants of health, as well as political sociology. And he's the author of the book, Beyond Obamacare, Life, Death, and Social Policy. As a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Jim recently chaired a task force on the 2020 census and published a powerful report on the citizenship question. He also happens to be my mentor, so I'm very grateful to welcome Jim House to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff, and um, thank you all uh, who are here and listening. Um, as Jeff indicated, um, there'll be a lot of there's overlap, as you can see, as the speakers go by on some of the issues here. Um, I'm here from the perspective of a group of the um, and the uh, a committee of the National Academy of Sciences, the Committee on Na uh, National Statistics, for which I served from 20. 12 to 2018, so like Barbara, I'm doing this just right after having ended this, and the last thing I was involved in was the preparation of what is now called a letter report, which I'll get to at the end of the presentation, um, from the NAS on the question of sh should there be a citizenship question added to the census, and what we examined that from the perspective of scientifically of what is the justification for this and what's the evidence for what kind of effects that it might have. Um, I'm going to start a little broader than that based on what you've heard. Um, the census and there's a larger system of what's called the federal statistical system in which the of which the census is the largest uh, unit. Um, that we generally take for granted most of the time. Uh, we assume that it's there, that it does the kinds of things that has been indicated that the census does, that other parts of it, uh, such as the Bureau of Labor Statistics, tell us what the situation is in the country with respect to the consumer price index, uh, the um, <coughs> uh, unemployment rate, and other parts of it um, do analysis in all kinds of areas. And I'll get to admit it a minute, a minute to more information than you ever would want to know, or at least uh, in a short period of time, uh, as to how this system is embedded uh, in the federal government. I think what I've come to appreciate uh, in the six years I spent on the Committee of National Statistics is not how important this is as a resource for information, uh, certainly for science, the whole areas in which Jeff indicated I've worked are fundamentally grounded in the data that are collected and disseminated through the census, through the National Center for Health Statistics, and other aspects of the federal statistical system. Uh, and the I have gotten greater appreciation, as Al's presentation suggested, of the breadth of use that is and value that these data have for the functioning of our society. Um, for the public sector at all levels, as this has been indicated in terms of allocation of resources, very much for the private sector as well, from which Al came from, in which he is very sensitive to the fact that um, private organizations uh, and um, use these data all the time in their work, uh, as do public organizations at all levels. Um, what I have become most aware of, in some sense, is how um, politically uh, uh, integrated, let's put it, or uh, and, and meshed the federal statistical system is in the broader um, nature of our government and the broader nature of the politics in our society. And as Senator Peters' uh, presentation suggested, it's a system that is increasingly challenged technologically around the issues that will be talked about more later in the morning around how do you manage, collect data, disseminate it, and do so in a way that protects the privacy of individuals. It's increasingly challenged economically in the way that almost all uh, aspects of our governmental and public or public goods infrastructure in this country are challenged. They have less money to try to do more things with it. And as we're seeing 
in part around this particular um, citizenship question. It's challenged um, politically these days as well. It's not clear that um, substantial parts of our society um, really understand and appreciate uh, the importance of these institutions to the functioning of a democratic society. And if we lose that appreciation, we are at risk of losing uh, one of the key foundations of a well-functioning democratic society. So let me just um, try to make a few um, comments here um, of a kind of background nature along these lines. You know, first is the point that you've heard something about already. The Census Bureau and the broader U.S. federal statistical system, or FSS as I've abbreviated it here, derives from and in, hence is inherently enmeshed in our political system. You've already heard from Al that uh, the census, or at least the process of enumerating the population every 10 years is front and center in the Constitution of the United States. It's in Article 1, Section 2, that there will be an enumeration. And this has been carried out in various ways from 1790 through the present, um, and originally um, by U.S. Marshals, uh, then through decennial census offices, we were supervised through the Secretary of State, and the Census Bureau as it exists today or has evolved today is a creature of the 20th and 21st century. Um, a whole series of other agencies have been established in the same way to deal with subsequent needs and problems that the society recognizes have developed. Uh, the economic and occupational and labor sector is a very large one that has been handled through the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, which was organized between 1884 and 1913 and continues to function today in very important ways. Um, and one of the last of these that's been formed is something called the Energy Information Administration, which basically grew out of the energy crisis of the 1970s and the discovery that we needed to understand and know how much energy do we have? Where is it coming from? How much is it costing us? And so on. And uh, those are, so we now have areas, we have the similar areas in education, agriculture, etc. Um, the second um, point that I'd like to drive home is that each of these agencies, that's a very decentralized system. Many other countries have a, a sort of central Office of National Statistics. Canada has something along with Statistics Canada. Uh, United Kingdom is not quite that way, but they have a, a central concern for it. There's an almost cabinet level position in um, the UK that, that's charged with protecting and promoting the ability <coughs> of the federal statistical system in the UK to function and operate as an independent and nonpartisan and unbiased provider of information to the society. Um, in the US, this is complicated considerably by uh, the way things are organized here. You're never going to fully read uh, everything in this table. I'm just going to try to see if I can, I guess does the pointer show up? I guess it doesn't that way, so I'll have to do it th this way um, for you to see. The important element to recognize is that every one of the statistical agencies, and over here on this, whoops, see, there we go. There the pointer. On the right side are the various statistical agencies. Uh, they are embedded underneath various committees that provide appropriations and oversight from the Congress, and they are embedded in different um, administrative portions of the executive uh, of the federal government. Um, the boxes in this figure, whoops, I keep hitting that, uh, such as here and here and so forth, every box indicates a, a position that is a presidential appointment. So it is, it is nominated by the president and goes through the federal confirmation hearings such so that's one of the recent one for Justice Kavanaugh is an example of that on a large scale, um, but that happens all the time. Um, as, you'll, as I'll come to in a minute, three of the directors of agencies are actually presidential appointees. I didn't realize that uh, until our Bob Groves from here was nominated for the census and went through a full-scale nomination process. So the outcome of this is that 
the administrators and the the rest of the most of the rest of the staff here are federal civil civil service employees. And from my experience, let me tell you, these are incredibly capable and dedicated people, uh, and they work under increasingly difficult conditions to try to fulfill um, some of the things that I will indicate in a moment are the key functions that a statistical agency or the whole system are uh, supposed to uh, fulfill. Um, let me just to point out um, that there are three of these directors Normally, you'll see pretty soon the director gets back to and reports to somebody who is a presidential appointee. So the political system sits over this. And that, as Barbara and other people have indicated, Secretary Wilbur Ross, as the Secretary of Commerce, uh, and operating through uh, his undersecretaries and so forth, has the right to give instructions to the Bureau of the Census as to how uh, they are supposed to operate. Um, the other, it's interesting, the other agencies that are involved here, uh, the second one that has been there for a long time, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and as I said, that does the CPI, the uh, unemployment rate, and a variety of other important things about uh, the functioning of the economy and the labor system in the country. And the third one uh, is the Energy Administration, which is a relatively small operation. But it, if, if, you may be able to infer what these three have in common. These are all the organizations that produce politically important and sensitive information, along with that information being important generally to the function of the society. So these, these Positions and these agencies are under a great deal of political challenge all the time in terms of how they do their work. Um, if you have time at some point, you can look through this whole table. It's quite, I found it quite interesting and kept learning things as I looked at it. Um, let me make one other third point, and this gets into where my particular relevance this morning comes from, is that since 1972, um, the... National Academy of Sciences has had a, a group called the Committee on National Statistics, the function of which is to provide um, by, un, unbiased scientific advice and counsel um, to all, any and all of the federal statistical agencies, largely at their request or at the request of Congress to consider aspects of how they function uh, or in other ways. And um, it's by virtue of um, this being on this committee that I got involved in the particular issue of the citizenship question. Let me just, before I get to that, indicate a couple of things that that's important. Here is the website um, that I'm going to get to that, uh, that where you can go to, to find a volume that the Committee on National Statistics has produced now through six editions and tends to to use and provide at the beginning of each new administration to the political members of the administration and to the people in the statistical agencies regarding what a federal statistical agency is supposed to be doing uh, for the government and for the society more broadly. Um, this volume is organized basically in terms of four basic principles uh, for what an agency is supposed to do. So the Census Bureau and any other is supposed to be providing information that is relevant, relevant to policy issues. Uh, and it's to be objective, accurate, timely, and that can be used in the policy process. Um, secondly, uh, it's critical, as Al has indicated in his presentation, that in doing that, uh, that the agency has credibility among its data users. People who use the data need to know and understand and believe that that data is accurate. In the age in which all information <laughs> is being increasingly challenged as to whether it is, quote, real or valid uh, or not, the Federal Statistical Agency stand as one of the ultimate foundations for information that can be used with confidence and trust by data users, and they've been seen that way for years. And uh, thirdly, as Al indicated, it's critical that 
federal statistical agencies be trusted by the people who provide them with their data, whether those are the individuals providing data to the census or organizations that provide uh, information for the economic censuses uh, and so forth. Um, then, and they need to know, again, the proper understand what the reasons for this are, how the data are used, and that their data is being kept confidential, and that is the law as of this point in time. And finally, in the latest edition of this book, there was a, a fourth principle added to emphasize the importance of the independence of statistical agencies from political and other do, undue external influences. Um, and I don't think I need to, you know, given the context of the discussion to this point, to indicate why it was felt to be important at this, this time to emphasize that as the fourth thing. So in thinking about what happens with the, the, the citizenship question or anything else that is done with the operation of a federal statistical agency like the census, one needs to keep in mind what is it going to do to these things. And as people have discussed already, this has, it, we're dealing with something that's highly policy relevant but has major issues in terms of potentially undermining the credibility of the data from the perspective of the users, providers, and um, politicizing the entire process. There are a whole series in this volume, and we won't have time to go in them, but again, if you go to the website, you can find them. There are a set of um, specific um, uh, operational principles that affect these things that include things like confidentiality, verifiability of data, oversight by appropriate um, scientific and other checks to make sure that the agency is operating functionally. As Senator Peters mentioned, he requested the GAO to take a look at what's the census doing to protect confidentiality of data, and that's a perfectly appropriate uh, thing to do. So now let me just get to uh, this, the ongoing, whether you want to call it concern, controversy, or opposition to the addition of the citizenship question to the 2020 census. It's worth knowing a little background, I think, in just thinking about this. Uh, it is not that citizenship has never been asked uh, in the census. It has been asked. Uh, it was asked, has been asked in varying ways over time. Uh, there have been questions about uh, birth order, birth origins, or say, citizenship from 1820 and 1830. Uh, there was a hiatus around the Civil War, and then it picked up again in 1870 uh, and continued from 1819 to 1950. It, but then it was dropped. So it's now been almost seven decades since the citizenship was question was answered. That with the question was answered. Uh, at the request of and at the expense of the state of New York and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico in 1960 for help for them in understanding who was a citizen of what and where. Um, and as has been indicated, but to help people recognize this, the census historically has been a relatively brief document that worked from the principle that the census's main function was to, quote, enumerate the population. Over time, other questions around things like citizenship, around education, around work that people did and so forth got added to the census and it got a little bit uh, unwieldy in certain ways and in 1970 a decision was made to separate the census into what is called the brief short form census which every household in the country gets and answers and a long form of the census which was given to, uh, I think, uh, this is consistent, Barbara said, about a sixth of the households, and it's been in the range of 15 to 20 percent um, generally. And on that, there was a longer set of information about the kinds of things that I just mentioned. Um, the, after 2000, the long form has been discontinued and replaced by something that Barbara mentioned that may not be clear to everybody called the American Community Survey which is an ongoing annual survey that over the course of a decade is intended to produce the same amount of same size and body of information that was produced from the long form, but to produce it in a way that keeps it constantly uh, up to date with changes in the nature of the population. And as Barbara indicated, currently that's about three million households a year are being covered 
uh, via the ACS, and the ACS comes up as in ways that she's already mentioned that are important. Um, so, um, the as you know, there are several. The controversy here is ongoing in various places. Uh, there is the congressional legislation that Senator Peters has been a leader on that is sitting. Uh, it is not going to go through the Congress as it is now constituted, and obviously the election will determine whether any legislation of that type will ever move forward out of the Congress. Uh, there are lawsuits ongoing, and again, as uh, uh, he mentioned, the largest of those is in the state of New York. Uh, it is due to uh, come to trial in November, and it, it is now being held up by another appeal, again, that Senator Peters mentioned, uh, by the Commerce Department to avoid Secretary Ross having to testify or otherwise give uh, depositions or statements as part of that, that hearing. But whenever that logjam is passed, uh, and many of you may know about and, or even be involved in some of the entities and organizations that are doing that, uh, that it, undoubtedly, I think, wherever it goes initially, is, will probably go all the way up uh, to the Supreme Court. And we don't know what will happen out of other those uh, two things. In the meantime, uh, there is a uh, normal process that goes on for changes of any kind that are made in the government in which there is public comment and input allowed. And that's going on right now with respect to the census. And that's the context in which the Committee on National Statistics um, did this letter report uh, trying to indicate what should we, uh, what is the, what do we think about the scientific justification need and potential impact of the citizenship question? And that report is available also publicly on the uh, National Academy's website. Um, <coughs> in that thing, we come down uh, based on consideration of our committee, which is independent of the one that Barbara was part of, uh, with a conclusion that it is not a good idea uh, to add a citizenship question at this time. And one has to recognize what is now being talked about is, is adding the citizenship question to the short form, which has a, currently has 10 questions on it. So this is, this is, this is a adding you know, a kind of 10% question increment. Uh, it's a very prominent one. It's not like this is going to be hidden in the midst of a lot of other information. It is very prominent. Uh, it's very public. And at this point, anybody is going to know about it if it ends up being there. Um, the, the reasons we came down against it was first um, was looking at the scientific. Is there a basis for this, given any of the um, so far stated reasons and needs for having the citizenship question, most of which have revolved around, quote, ability to better enforce the Voting Rights Act. And again, our conclusion, as others, is that the American Community Survey provides all the information that has been needed for uh, a half century uh, or through the long form and now through the um, ACS. There's all the information that's, been ne that's needed there to fulfill the functions that are being asked for. Um, it, um, secondly, the report says that it clearly uh, almost certainly will impair and damage aspects of the quality of the census. Unfortunately, no one has empirical data at this point in time to say definitively what that would be. If we could say definitively that we know from prior information that putting a question like this on here depresses the response rate by 10 percent, the issue would be very, be very different than it is right now. We unfortunately don't have that information. But all the indications are that it is likely to do that. It's likely to. Uh, there are problems in this. This is treated as, quote, reinstating. Uh, Senator, or Secretary Ross has said we're reinstating the citizenship question. Well, that's not exactly the case because it hasn't really been asked in exactly this context in this form before. And as Senator Peters emphasized, the normal process in the census is extensive testing over three to five years of any new content that goes in to the survey. That is impossible given the date that the request was made. And so this would be essentially being put in there with no prior information about its effect. And it will undoubtedly, or at least uh, very likely, drive up the costs at the same time that it's lowering the quality. Um, 
Uh, as Barbara attested to, there is this prior incidence, which is relevant here. If it were the case that the citizenship question um, totally uh, or in very major ways impaired the functioning and the quality of the 2020 census, it is possible that that could be used as a justification for not using the 2020 census to reapportion uh, representation in the House of Representatives. And we would be back in a situation for under slightly different circumstances and reasons uh, as existed in the 1920s. And that's obviously, as we know, a very politically consequential thing. It's not sure that that could happen. And no one, certainly the Census Bureau itself, is doing everything it can under the circumstances to try to make sure there is a successful census. Uh, and finally, um, there was the conclusion that uh, that to insert a, a question like this, um, where there has been from Senator, from Secretary Ross and others statements that this information would be used to help to develop a national register of citizenship. Uh, and that is a um, use of census data that is a violation of the principles that I just indicated, and it's a violation of the current legal statutes on the way that census information can be used or transferred uh, in other ways. So on that basis, our conclusion was this was bad. That that comment period has just ended, ended. all of that information is being processed. We don't know what will come out of that as of now. Um, so in conclusion, I would uh, just to suggest to you that, that you may not have thought so, and I'm not sure I would have thought so uh, eight or ten years ago, that um, the federal statistical system is a big, quote, political issue, but it really is. In the same way that the president appoints people to the courts and the Supreme Court, and that's a political issue, the president appoints people who oversee the operation of the statistical system and the Congress in its own way uh, advises, councils, and legislates uh, in that process as well. So when you're voting, to the extent that you can, uh, think about what the implications of your vote is likely to be in terms of the operation of your, not only the federal system, but this goes down as well at the level of states which have comparable kinds of things. Um, if you're interested in a bunch of these issues, this is a thing that I came on across in doing this. It's a law review article that provides a very nice review of the history of the use of the census and the principles that have been applied in apportioning representation in the House of Representatives. And you'd be amazed at how many different ways and forms that has taken over the history of the country. And any of those are still possible, given the fact that there is nothing mandated in the Constitution about the way, except an apportionment across the states, somehow appropriate to a population, there is no other uh, requirements on the nature of the districts, the size of districts, and so on and so forth. So uh, with, with that, um, I hope you will uh, be able to think a little bit more, better about uh, the issue as it continues to go forward from here. And I look forward to uh, the rest of the discussion as I have enjoyed the prior presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, that was a fantastic overview of the federal st uh, statistical data system, and uh, along with Barbara for kind of foreshadowing the possible political implications of, of these issues that we're talking about. Um, I, I hope that we can also make available the, the various uh, reports and articles that Jim had uh, mentioned in his slides on the ISR website, so we'll be sure to do that. Um, our next speaker is Angela Ocampo. Angela is an, an LSNA collegiate postdoctoral fellow in the political science department here at the University of Michigan. Her research examines the political incorporation of racial, ethnic, and religious minorities as both participants and as political leaders within American, American institutions. Welcome, Angela. Thank you.
Aiden, look at the screen. Let's see. I have some really cool graphs I want to show you also. This is going to be... Also, the clicker is not working for some reason. Apologize for the delay. Let's try a couple more things. Sorry. Just like it's out of reach. That's where we can't see There we go. Okay, good. Good. All right, awesome. <laughs> um, so um, I'm really excited to be here and to present on um, some of the work. Okay that I'm particularly interested in, which is the political participation and uh, public opinions of racial and ethnic minorities. Um, so I'm going to be specifically talking about the potential impact of asking citizenship status for racial, ethnic minorities and immigrant communities. So uh, by now, we're all experts in sort of the history of the citizenship question, and we've heard from our, the two uh, previous presentations, Barbara and Jim, um, that the citizenship question has been asked um, and has been asked over time, but it's 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 been asked in different ways. Um, so in, in previous times, it, uh, it's been asked the total count of people who are non-naturalized foreigners, um, and then sort of the question um, has taken different forms, um, and um, it's been asked in, in not only the census, um, but in more recent times is asked in the, in the ACS. The actual citizenship status question stopped being asked in the 1950, and after the, uh, the 2000, um, the, after 2000, uh, the data collection on citizenship has been via the American Community Survey. Um, so as it was uh, previously mentioned by some of the, our, our, our speakers, um, there's also some history and contentious history as to how this census and citizenship data has been used um, and has been shared with other, other government officials. So we know uh, there's evidence that the census has cooperated with government officials in, uh, in, in sharing uh, the data, um, in sharing um, information of individuals who lived in, in large uh, Japanese communities, and in particular also micro-level data, so, so individual-level data of individuals who were of Japanese ancestry who lived in D.C. And these individuals were targeted, uh, which then um, you know, was, uh, led to their internment in the, in, 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 uh, during World War II. Another really important um, sort of history of how the census data has been used, which is, it, it, this is currently legal, but uh, it, it, it draws, uh, and, and it sort of uh, draws a lot of concern and, and, and worries among uh, individuals as to how the sharing of information between the census and other government entities might influence um, what's, you know, might influence or might impact uh, targeting of communities in different ways. So in 
2004. The census gave information to the Department of Homeland Security about neighborhoods with large numbers of Arab Americans. Um, these were zip, level, zip code level breakdowns uh, of Arab Americans organized by country. Again, as I mentioned, this is legal, um, but there was serious concern as to how this was going to be used, particularly um, given the fact that uh, this was in sort of in the aftermath of uh, the September 11 attacks. And there's also there had also been a lot of backlash against uh, the Arab American community. And so, um, with sort of this history in the in, in the backdrop, um, it's it's important to understand why these previous episodes um, are, are 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 of concern um, to uh, how racial and ethnic minorities might feel about answering the question on the census and what their what their fears and 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 and, and um, hesitancy to answer such question might be given given such history. So um, I want to point out that uh, immigrant minority communities are living in fear. And this is sort of the current, current state of affairs. They're experiencing daily discrimination, threats of separation, detention, and deportation. And not just threats, right? They're actually living uh, through this in, 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 in the current uh, times. And so they've already been targeted, and, and, and fear is, is, is alive, right, among these communities. So there, we've seen an increase in the arrests, um, immigration arrests since 2017. It's been an increase of 30%. Um, we've seen that the travel ban of individuals coming from Muslim-majority countries, um, it's, still, it's still happening. Um, and um, we've also uh, seen that immigrant communities have been targeted uh, by the De uh, Department of, of Justice uh, as it attempted to rescind uh, the Defer for, uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals uh, in 2017, which this program uh, allowed undocumented uh, uh, youth to have a reprieve from deportation. And so um, the fears are real because there's been actual targeting of these communities in the current administration. And um, I, I, I want to present these quotes because they really speak to the fear that I'm talking to you all about. I can tell you that these communities are targeted, but there's no other way to really understand what this fear is like among racial and ethnic and immigrant communities. So here we have a quote from Carmen uh, Quevedo. She's a 46-year-old uh, woman native of Gu Guatemala. And she's, she's answering this question. She's asked, right, and, and, and this is after it was announced that the citizenship question was going to be added to the 2020 census. So she was asked, what, what would you do? Are you going to answer? And she said, I would never answer because I don't have papers. Obviously, I'm afraid, and I have a son, right? So there's a serious concern and fear among immigrant communities <coughs> that this is going to have repercussions and there's going to be a backlash and they're afraid not just for themselves but for their families. Another individual who was asked um, what he would do and whether or not he would answer the census, right, and so even though we're hearing um, about how the census is having uh, sort of innovations in, 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 in finding better ways to ensure that we have response rates, right, individuals um, are also going to be afraid of people coming at their door, right? So even if we try to try to address some of these um, low response rates via recontacting and via in person uh, knocking on their doors, individuals are going to be afraid. So Cesar, uh, when asked about the the 2020 census and the citizenship question, he said the following. He said, "I know that no parent in my neighborhood is going to be opening the door for anyone doing a survey, right?" So um, Cesar speaks to this fear of, 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 of government entities, government officials, and having contact and being fearful of anyone coming at your door. Because usually the people that are coming at the doors of many of these immigrant households uh, is immigration and customs enforcement. So I want to point out that, um, that the fear is not only among one racial and ethnic group, it's among many groups. And it's because um, the sort of issue of, of uh, immigration and, and being undocumented or being in mixed status family uh, spans across racial and ethnic groups. So uh, one of seven Asian Americans is undocumented, and this is something that sometimes is, is untalked about. We only think of the issue of immigration as being a Latino-Latino issue. Uh, but this is also is something that is going to affect uh, the Asian American uh, population. Um, and um, it's going to affect, so I want to be really clear about this, it's going to affect not only response rates of, of individuals who are undocumented themselves, but individuals 
who live in what we call these mixed status households. And these are households that include uh, one unauthorized uh, adult and one U.S. born child. So we see that there's a large population of individuals that are living <laughs> in these mixed status households. Um, and, you know, the issue of, of, of immigration is something that, and it's sort of this fear, is pretty, it's, it's close and it's personal. Um, so we know that on average about 60% of Latinos report knowing someone who is undocumented, either a family or friend, and one in three Latinos report knowing someone who has faced deportation or detention. So these are not just abstract fears that are sort of floating around, right? These are concrete numbers that let us know that um, adding the citizenship question to the census can have real repercussions given the fear among racial and ethnic communities. Um, I'm going to show you some, some additional evidence of, of fear among uh, these uh, racial and ethnic uh, groups and communities. Um, so there was some pretesting done by the U.S. Census and the National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations. And, and, and this data has revealed some concerns about confidentiality um, that immigrant communities feel. And uh, this data was collected from uh, February to September of 2017, and it, it, of two, until 2017, and it included focus groups and interviews in various languages. And so here, um, we have one respondent from the Arabic focus group um, that, that said, you know, they, this person stated, in light of the current political situation, immigrants, specifically Arabs and Mexicans, would be so scared when they see a government interview or other forceps. Again, this gives us additional evidence that it is not only um, affecting one racial and ethnic group, but more than one, and that the fear of having contact with a government employee or a field staff from the U.S. Census who's coming to inquire after you haven't really filled out uh, the questionnaire online or on or the tablet, um, that people are fearful. Um, so another respondent from the Arabic focus groups argued that the immigrants are not going to trust the census employees when they're continuously hearing contradicting messages from the media, every threatening to deport immigrants, right? So the political climate is something that really affects the way that racial and ethnic minorities feel about their relationship to the political system and elected officials. So when they're hearing contradictory messages in the media, right, some the things that we, we have heard yesterday about the possibility of uh, this executive order to end uh, birthright citizenship, that's something that is sending the message to racial and ethnic minorities that, um, that the government is not, is not trusting. Um, and that the administration does not have their best concerns in mind. Furthermore, the field staff that were conducting these focus groups and the testing of these questions, uh, they, they reported unusual behavior. So respondents uh, walked out of, of the, the uh, interview they were having within their own homes. They were visibly nervous when asked about uh, uh, immigration um, or citizenship. And um, the respondents were worried about even given like, their legitimate names. And so this is some of the, the reports that were coming from the, the, the census staff that was conducting a lot of this pre-testing ahead of the, the 2020 census. Um, I also, um, I want to show you some really interesting and neat results that um, have just come my way via uh, a tracking poll of uh, Latino adults. Um, it, this election cycle and this data comes from Latino Decisions, which is a big polling firm that has been tracking the attitudes of Latinos um, as we are approaching the midterm election. So um, this survey asked Latinos various questions about the U.S. Census. The first one that I'm going to be showing you today, it's about uh, their responses to how they feel about um, the importance um, of implementing an accurate count of the entire Latino population, right? So we have very high levels of agreement. 71% of Latinos um, believe that it's very important for the U.S. Census to implement a complete and accurate count, right? So it's, you know, adding up the varying the somewhat, we get close to 93% uh, of respondents in this national survey believe that it's very important, right? This is something that they're also concerned about. They're concerned about an accurate count. When we asked Latinos about um, whether or not they trusted the Trump administration to keep confidential the personal information that they collected, including citizenship um, and the status of immigrants, and we asked them if, if they felt um, that the 
Trump administration was going to share this information with other federal agencies. We have close to um, close to 70 percent of respondents um, didn't feel, didn't trust the Trump administration, didn't feel confident. They felt that the Trump administration was going to share this data with other federal agencies. So this is a high number. Moreover, we asked individuals in this national um, survey how concerned they were that their answers about people's citizenship could be shared with agencies such as Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And we found that 54% of Latinos were very concerned that this was going to be shared with ICE, and 25% were somewhat concerned. So accounting for both the very what and somewhat, we see that these are very high numbers of Latinos who are extremely concerned that people's answers on the citizenship question on the 2020 census is going to be shared with ICE, right? So now we have, in addition to the quotes that I share with you, we have national uh, representative data that says that these concerns are real. Um, I want to also show some additional uh, evidence um, that uh, leads us to, to, to believe that um, there's going to be low responses in households um, that have no, that have non-citizens. So there was this recent research done by the Center of Economic Studies and a group of scholars uh, took advantage of the fact that um, uh, in the 2010 census, um, that in 2010 there were individuals who answered both the 2010 census and the 2010 ACS. So if you, if you remember, the 2010 ACS does ask citizenship, but the 2010 census does not. The census doesn't ask citizenship. So um, these researchers took advantage of the fact that um, these individuals answer both the 2010 ACS and the 2010 U.S. Census, the same housing units, and they wanted to uh, compare the response rates of uh, these households to forecast the potential effect of adding a citizenship question, right? So what they did is they, they compared uh, these response rates. And so they did a couple of different things, so I'm going to uh, try to walk, with them, uh, walk through them really quick. So um, they calculated these response rates for the 2010 ACS and the 2010 census for two groups of households. The first group of households were um, households that they called non-sensitive or less sensitive, and those were the households that based on administrative records, uh, all of the individuals in those households were citizens. So that's uh, these households right here. And then they calculate also these self-response rates for the households where, uh, where potentially uh, sensitive households to the citizenship question. And those were the households over here that based on administrative records, they had at least one individual that was a non-citizen. So one of the first things that we can uh, see from here is that um, there's already a high, higher responses rates for the census, right? So we really can't take this as evidence um, that, you know, individuals are, are sort of, um, are, are, are less inclined to answer or, or are impacted by the citizenship question because on average, both for the um, non-sensitive and the sensitive households, we have higher uh, responses rates for the census. Uh, and then we have lower responses rates for the ACS. So this is probably due to the fact that, um, as it was mentioned before, there's a lot of uh, engagement with community-based organizations and partnerships, and there's a, there, there's a big media campaign to try to get individuals to answer the survey, right? So part of this, the sort of greater propensity to answer the, the, the census comes from that, right? But um, what's sort of difficult to, to understand, right, um, is why... Um, we have uh, sort of different response rates within uh, the same type of survey, either the ACS or the UC Census, for a given sen uh, sensitivity group. So we see here that households with at least uh, one uh, individual in the household that's not a citizen, in, in the 2010 ACS that did have the citizenship question, the response rate is 42.4% that response rate is much higher in the 2010 ACS for respondents that live in households where everyone is a citizen, right? So we see, we see a big difference here. 
So to really understand and, and to account for the fact that people are already much more likely to answer the 2010 census anyway, they did a different diff analysis and they have a successive number of different analyses in the paper uh, with a lot of robustness checks um, to, to better understand um, these differences in, in the propensity in, in respondents in these sensitive households to answer at lower rates. So we find here um, in just a simple diff and diff analysis that um, Respondents in these sensitive households are 8.9 uh, percentage points less likely to answer um, when they're asked the citizenship question. So some of these implications have already been mentioned um, by some of the previous presenters. Um, and I do want to underscore that um, if, responses, if response rates are, are low among racial and immigrant communities, this is going to have an effect on representation in Congress. And it's going to have an effect particularly in the places where there are large immigrant populations. So a place like a state like California could lose uh, six congressional seats. States like New York, um, Texas, um, Illinois will also lose congressional seats. And other states that have lower levels of immigrant populations will gain seats. Wyoming, Utah, so on and so forth. Census uh, data is also used for determining federal funding um, that's disbursed to states for various programs. And so if we have an inaccurate count of particular racial and ethnic minorities, uh, this is going to have a negative impact on, on how um, this data is used for the allocation uh, to really important uh, federal programs and federal funding, including Medicaid, SNAP, Medicare, Part B, among others. Um, and I also want to want to highlight um, that undercounting, uh, and particularly racial and ethnic and immigrant communities, um, it's, it's going to be really problematic and it's really going to compromise research um, of these particular communities. So it's estimated by the 2015, um, our population is going to be of the entire U.S. majority minority, right? So that minorities are going to be the largest, um, we're going to account for the largest uh, proportion of the U.S. population. So having a, 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 a low estimate and a low count of racial and ethnic minorities in 2010, in one year, um, can influence how we understand this population over many, many years and for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. That was really interesting and puts a real human face on a lot of the issues that we've been talking about. Our next speaker, um, I'm very glad to welcome, is Kurt Metzger, who is a demographer and um, along with Ren Farley, who's also in the audience, is like one of our re the leading experts on, on population change in the Detroit metro area. Uh, Kurt is, uh, he founded the Detroit Area Community Information System, which is now better known as Data Driven Detroit and was recently the Director of Research at the United Way of Southeast Michigan. And Kurt has also served as a Geographic Specialist at the Census and um, is currently the Mayor of the City of Pleasant Ridge, which for those of you who don't know is in Oakland County. So, Your Honor, Kurt Metzger. <laughs> this is a tough gig, six presenter and a morning of six. Uh, I will try to make this as painless as possible, no slides. So. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is I really do appreciate more today than ever that I'm retired. That commute here this morning was just awful, so, uh, but uh, I'm glad to be here. I, what I'm trying to give you a little bit of presentation, as, as Jeff gave you kind of my, a little bit of background, but just kind of walk you through some of my history to give you, to bring us up to date. You've heard a lot about the census and the way 2020 is going to be conducted. I came to the Census Bureau from Cincinnati back in 1975 to actually be what they called a geographic planning specialist when they moved geographic planning out into the regions for the first time and we were running around updating maps, going to planning agencies. And at that time, maps were actually done in Jeffersonville, Indiana. They were done on mylar. People would rub those little block numbers on the maps and then they would photograph them and then they would distribute them in these big binders. Um, so I did that, moved into the administrative uh, operations for the 1980 census um, in Detroit, 
running 37 district offices in terms of administrative activities in Ohio and Michigan. And then after the census became the head of information services, where I finally got to utilize the information that was being published by the census. All that data that were being collected, how were they being used? At that time, we were putting them in books. And I would load up my, uh, my, the trunk of my car with all the census books and go out and do workshops. How do you start to find data in these books? Some of you may remember those days. Takes me way back to good times. Um, but it was that that really gave me that love of what the census really means and how you can actually, I remember talking to an NAACP group in Columbus, Ohio and having them just the eyes light up and saying, so this is where the data that National is giving us. They're telling us what our allocation is and why, and now we can actually fight for ourselves. And it was that kind of empowerment, that democratization, giving people access to information that they could then use to challenge authority, to do their own kinds of planning. And so I um, was with the census up until 1990, and then started through the 1990 census and moved over to Wayne State University, which was part of a state data center program. The Census Bureau set up the state data center program throughout the United States as a way of kind of counteracting these large data companies like CACI and others that, that were created to run mainframe computer tapes and charge an inordinate amount of money. And, and really, it was the private sector that had access to the data the people on the street didn't have that access, and it was much more detailed than what you could get in the books. And so the State Data Center program was set up so that you'd have universities and others distributing data throughout the state, but also having access to these computer tapes and being able to give them at no and low cost to people. And so it was adding that kind of information. So we had something called MIMIC, the Michigan Metropolitan Information Center back there in the Center for Urban Studies. And I did that up until 2005, so I ran the 2000 census when I was in it, at Mimic, and we did a lot of outreach and helped the Census Bureau um, conduct the 2000 census as much as possible. 2005, I went to the United Way as research director and actually started to say, okay, this is again now applying the data. How do we use the data? How do we do it for our own internal purposes, but also to help grantees and other partners? Here are the data. How do we start to use it? How can you use it to, to write your proposals, et cetera? So it's always this kind of love of how do we use this information and how valuable it is. And then in 2008, um, the Skillman Foundation and Kresge Foundation, things were a little bit in flux in Detroit, obviously. Um, we were soon having three mayors in three years. Um, we now were in recession. The foreclosure crisis was really hitting. And foundations were going to start to invest in the city. They needed to know where they should be investing and how are they going to evaluate those investments? And so they came to me at United Way and said, we've got $1.8 million for a three-year program. Could you start something? And we created the, um, what we call Data Driven Detroit now, which is still alive and well, even though I've been gone for four years. Um, and it was really to give, again, information down to the lowest level of geography, down to the block level, and then aggregate it with other kind of information from other government agencies, from local, um, local government, et cetera, et cetera, trying to build all that kind of information to make it available <coughs> to the public. And also to, to really to work with local governments to try to help in the 2010 census. As I said, we knew 2010 was going to be tough. 2008, Kwame Kilpatrick was mayor when I when I got the, the gig with D3, as we call it. Um, he soon left and was replaced by Ken Cockrell, who was there for about a year and a half, and then he was replaced by Dave Bing in 2010. So he had this, you had the city in flux with the foreclosure crisis and all the other um, economic issues. You had three different mayors coming on. We told Detroit this was going to be the toughest census that they'd had in years. They had to get out, they had to do outreach, Fortunately, the Michigan Nonprofit Association and others were doing a nonprofit efforts to get out into the community. The city said, we don't have the resources. We're not going to do it. We can't do it. So Detroit, while you had the state doing various efforts, other communities doing efforts, Detroit kind of begged off. The result was the city of Detroit lost 238,000 people between 2000 and 2010. 
Did they really leave, lose 238? We'll never know. Um, it could be because of the undercount, because they did a lousy job getting the word out. Um, you know, the nonprofit community and others could only do so much, but you didn't have the city really pushing it. 25% um, of the population disappeared. And we've been living with that population now dropping slowly. We're at about 672, according to the latest estimates. And Mike Duggan has said population growth will be the one measure of his success if we can turn around the population. Every year we think that it might be. I'm still waiting for 2018 estimates. I still think Detroit will do it. But um, the, I think the importance of outreach, the importance of people getting out there and pushing the census is very critical. And so I, my main point is to, to mention an effort now undergoing, uh, going on in the state um, that obviously we will have complete count committees coming at the community level. We will have a complete count commission, I'm sure, at the state level. But right now we have something called, and I want to get it right, the Census 2020 Michigan Nonprofits Count Campaign. And Joan Gustafson is here from the Michigan Nonprofit Association. You can ask her all the detailed questions. But it is a program to mobilize nonprofits throughout the state. There's a wonderful advisory committee of groups across the state, a lot of the various minority and, and uh, persons of color, the various groups across the state that are getting very activated. We realize that the Census Bureau telling people to fill out the census and that it's private and it's wonderful doesn't cut it. Even city government telling you, you know, trust you, trust us. We, this is very important. We need it because of funding, because of political representation. People kind of just go, yeah, that's great. We know what, we hope that voter turnout next Tuesday will show us something that we've never seen before, but we have to wait. But certainly census participation is not on everybody's uh, radar and is not, they're not very, and you just heard, a lot of people are afraid of the census and certainly more this time than before. But they do trust their nonprofits. They do trust the groups in the community, their, their neighbors, the groups that are providing programming for them, that are giving the kinds of aid that they, that they need. Um, they are trusted, um, trusted participants in the community and people will listen to them. So there's a big effort. The Michigan Nonprofit Association has combined with a number of foundations. Kellogg is starting it off. Over 20 foundations have now put money into a campaign that's going to be up to $4.7 million. The state's put in a half a million dollars toward that. So it, we're really looking forward to a tremendous outreach that will kind of overcome maybe some of the other issues that we have to face going forward. So I just want to say that the campaign website is becountedmi2020.com. That'll be available to you, um, certainly in the notes and everything after the conference. So I just wanted to be really quick, but it's, it's just... The census is kind of why I got to be where I was, just starting out, leaving graduate school in the middle of a dissertation to work for the Census Bureau and uh, have never looked back. So um, I look forward to any kinds of questions. I will stop right there. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you to everyone in the audience for sticking with us. We're, we, I know we've had a lot of speakers, but I hope you agree that this was very informative and a really provocative session. So now we're going to take questions, and as I understand it, there are going to be people traveling around with microphones for people who raise their hands because we need to get all this on, uh, on tape or, on, or on the, in the cloud, so to speak. Thank you. Barbara, thank you very much for your presentation. Our uh, student, Nicholas Jones, superintends the collection of racial and ethnic data for uh, the Census Bureau. Two years ago at the Population Association meeting, he presented an exceptionally lucid paper which reported that the Census Bureau's pretesting of the MENA question was very successful. That is a question that would treat Middle Eastern and North African as a racial category. Subsequently, the decision was made not to ask that question. And I'm wondering if you could tell us 
uh, who made that decision and why? And the second question, which may be more appropriate for Al Fortino, and that is, what's the final deadline for a decision about questions on Census 2020? I assume the Secretary of Commerce cannot decide in February of 2020 that he wants a question about the number of pets in the household or something added to the census. What's the deadline for that? Um, is this on or what do I do? It's on. Um, thank you. Um, I was hoping that you'd ask, someone would ask that. And on the first question, you're right about Nicholas Jones. He and his racial and ethnic branch did a fabulous job. And we looked, the Census Scientific Advisory Committee looked at what he did, the other federally mandated advisory committee, the National Advisory Committee, which especially looks at race and ethnicity, looked at it. They tested things every way imaginable. And as you said, you're completely correct, came out with fabulous results. This was both on the MENA question, but it also was related to asking a combined um, racial and ethnicity question because there was increasingly a, a problem that uh, many Hispanics would check some other race in terms of racial category because the understanding of people was not the same as the understanding. And I think that the census people thought and the impression I'd had was that this was going to go along swimmingly and it would be changed for 2020. However, as I think you know, the change in any racial or ethnic categories on official data collections like this um, have to be approved by the Office of Management and the Budget. And when I asked high up people, and they said, no. OMB said, no, we're going to keep it the way it is. And the way I understand it from people quite high up in the Census Bureau is that OMB gave no explanation whatsoever about why they said no. And I think it was quite a shock to a lot of, it was a shock to my committee, and it was a shock to a lot of um, census people when they thought this was all perfectly clear and a done deal. Hi, I'm going to respond to your question on the deadline. We have indicated publicly that we needed final decisions on questions by June of 2019 in order to get the printing done, in order to get other aspects done. However, at cost and increased risk, we could push several months past that, but every month we push, it increases the risk that potentially damages the quality of the census and it increases the cost of getting it done. The long pole in the tent right now is the paper part of it, interestingly enough, because we have complete electronic systems that ask it without the question and now with the question because we ran the 18 into and test without the question because it was prior to that decision. So we're concerned. I will say we don't have a print contractor at the moment because our print contractor declared chapter 11 and we have put it out for bid. Uh, we will be awarding a new contract in November this month. Uh, we currently are in the final evaluation stages of the bid. Once we get a new contractor on board, it'll give us an opportunity to sit with them and work through their production schedules and capabilities to refine that final deadline for changing print capabilities. Thank you. <clears throat> Perhaps Barbara would know this. Um, how are institutional populations going to be counted. That's been a notorious problem in Michigan because in the city of Ionia, a very small town that has no reason for existence other than staff for the six correctional facilities, most of those people come from Wayne, Genesee, or Saginaw counties. And they are very disproportionate. For example, in Michigan, we, when we had 51,000 people in the, in the prisons in Michigan, they were all disproportionately in the western and the upper peninsula part of the state. And, and the, they, they were not counted where their homes were. This reflected tremendously on the, the uh, evaluation of a place like Wayne County with respect to people of color. More than half of the population in prison are people of color. 
I mean, and, and they're also disproportionately poverty. So are those going to be, how are those going to be counted? May I say something and then someone else and you can tell me what I said that was wrong? Okay. Um, no, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, there, there's two aspects. One is these are group quarter populations and there have been considerable problems with some of this. The, um, but also my understanding, and Al will correct me, is that um, incarcerated populations um, in terms of the uh, census allocation are, I'm not defending it, I'm just trying to explain it, are counted at the place of the institution. Some states, I believe Maryland, changed their laws so that for um, allocations, legislative districts within the state, that they are attributed back to their place of residence before they were incarcerated. But that is not for federal purposes. And Al can <coughs> give a better answer than I did. Oh, Barbara, that was a great thing. Um, just to right. fill in the spaces there, we made the decision <coughs> in our residence criteria to continue the way we've always counted all people in the census, and that's where they are living or staying on census day, and where they have been living or staying on census day. Prisoners on census day that are incarcerated are counted <coughs> at the place of incarceration where they are. However, we provide, we will provide an app to any state that wants to, that allows them to take our data and reapportion the locations of their persons for state redistricting purposes and for state activities. In 2010, Maryland used it and we were testing the app at that point in time. We now will make it available to any state that wants to take that app and move people to their city from whence they were incarcerated for state internal state redistricting activities. But from a federal standpoint, since our primary purpose is really um, for state, I mean, for federal information, we will not be changing the way we count prisoners on a federal level. Well, I'm, I'm reluctant to correct Al, but <laughs> what he said was almost totally true, as I understand it. For things like college students who don't live with their parents are counted at the place of their college. However, high school students who are at boarding school um, are attributed to the place of residence of their parents rather than the place of the boarding school. You're, you're correct, Barbara. That's our one exception. Just is. a detail. But college students are counted at the campus <laughs> where they are, and prisoners are counted in the prison. Can I ask a follow-up question? I, um, it, and that is that I've recently had several discussions with people in which they they um, emphasized or they, they sort of suggested the possibility that while the federal census is what's used for reapportionment, that states actually have a lot of discretion to use other sources of information, including the ACS, including, as you suggest, uh, an app that would replay, you know, sort of put people in their um, in their home communities if they're in in, uh, in prisons, um, and and is this something that, that we should be encouraging states to think about more in terms of redistricting if we think that there are going to be problems in the 2020? If people have thought, I, I had never even, it never occurred to me that we could use different sources of information to do these two things until the last couple of weeks. So I was just wondering whether people had thought about this um, and had knew, knew more about the, the, the legal or um, statistical possibilities. Uh, I'm James Whitehorn. I'm with the Census Bureau as well. I'm, I run the Redistricting and Voting Rights State Office, so this particular topic goes straight uh, to the heart of some of the stuff that we work through. Um, you are correct. There, states do sometimes use their own data to augment the census data. Uh, Maryland was a state that <laughs> actually reallocated prisoners back to their home of record, uh, and they actually did it for redistricting for congressional, state legislative, and the law actually says all local uh, redistricting is supposed to use that new base data set that they've created. But this isn't really something new. Um, the states of Kansas used to conduct its own census and use that data to redistrict by, uh, which was considered perfectly acceptable. 
they still do a reallocation of students in military prior to doing the redistricting. Hawaii does the same thing. They create a resident population base where they, they remove some students and military that are considered non-resident before they do it. And all of these different scenarios have been upheld by the courts, including the use of the Maryland data. Uh, you have four states now on deck who are going to do this prisoner reallocation. Uh, you have New York State, which did it last time in 2010 in Maryland. New York only does it for state legislative. They still use the congressional counts for congress or, or the the census counts for congressional. California is doing it uh, as well, uh, but only for state prisoners. Um, so you have all these different flavors around. But you, uh, the fourth state is Delaware. Delaware had a, a law on the books to do it in 2010, and then they passed emergency legislation to uh, delay until 2020. They didn't feel they were ready to, to undertake the operation. But so you, you're you're very correct. Um, People do have the ability to uh, make modifications to the Census Bureau as long as it's uh, consistent and, and not arbitrary the way they're doing it. But that's within the state. It's within not the state, state, yes. Um, one thing to me, this, uh, I don't think people appreciate how much the Census Bureau really um, works on their questions on you know the way the questionnaire looks at male and female are now left and right instead of on top of each other for um, so you won't have um, miss strokes and stuff doesn't matter as much on electronic but on paper it does but if you were gonna ask a citizenship question I'm surprised that people think that the the complicated version that's in the ACS is appropriate it could just be are you a citizen yes no I'm a person born abroad of US citizens you know what difference does that make? You know, it should just be a yes, no question. But the Census Bureau didn't get to test that part of it. Um, you know, so this is so um, obvious that it doesn't have the hands of the Census Bureau on it because that's not the way they do things. Well, well you're, you're right. The question, the citizenship question plan for the 2020 Census is directly from the ACS, which is kind of a strange question because of the concerns of some territories. So it's kind of unnecessarily complicated. But when uh, Wilbur Ross required this, they just plonked on the ACS question without doing anything, which is very unusual and pretty stupid. Anybody else on the panel have thoughts on that? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute break, I believe, and then uh, reconvene for the, the next panel, which is on data security. Thank you.
the speakers who are going to talk about privacy issues related to the <coughs> census 2020, I would like to um, offer a shout out and an enormous thanks to Catherine Allen West, um, who's our Director of Communications here at ISR. Um, Catherine has done a fabulous job um, organizing this, and, um, and we really appreciate it. So thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Um, I am, uh, we, our next um, set of speakers are going to address issues around 
um, census uh, 2020 privacy issues. The census is taking some, some new innovative um, steps to try to protect privacy, um, to ensure, to address the issues of respondent trust um, that we talked about um, in the first session. Um, but they also raised, I think, actually some interesting that we've had those sort of respondent trust and um, user, what did we, what was the National Academy's trust and usability kind of. And I think that those are actually the, the challenges that we're going to be addressing um, in this session today. And I'm really looking forward to um, hearing um, the presentations from the speakers. Our first speaker is John Elting. Um, John is the Assistant Director for Research and Methodology at the Census Bureau. He's a member of the Federal Committee on Statistical Methodology and the Committee on Fellows of the American Statistical Association. Um, he's co-chair of the Oh, a bunch of journals. Um, he has his PhD is from statistics at the University of Iowa. So he comes from the Big Ten. We're always happy to bring people from DC back to the Big Ten. Um, I always I always joke that we have, um, as you'll see, we have. I think of Michigan as part of the rotation in the professional development of the of the statistical system. Um, but I don't think John has has actually been at Michigan. But we're glad to hear you weren't far. Um, but John's going to speak to us about. Um, about the 2020 plans for privacy protection, and I'll turn things over to them. Tim. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Maggie. I, I should raise, um, um, keeping with Maggie's last comment there, I should mention I was raised about um, 30 miles uh, east ah. of here, so um, perhaps at least uh, indirectly I have a little bit of a connection with the University of Michigan. Also mentioned that we had a wonderful uh, opening of a research data center for the Census Bureau um, on the Front Range, happened to be in Colorado, but it was on the Front Range of the Rocky Mountains. Um, last autumn, uh, and in fact, um, had a chance then to uh, acknowledge the fact that two leading people in the Census Bureau in the previous uh, century, uh, Morris Hansen and W. Edwards Deming, uh, both in fact were raised in the Front Range, um, and Deming got his bachelor's degree at University of Wyoming. So uh, we uh, also have connections with lots of other institutions. We're always delighted to have a chance to come out and have discussion. Um, a little bit of background on this particular presentation. I'd like to convey greetings from the main authors of this presentation today, Simpson Garfinkel and John Abab. Uh, due to unavoidable constraints, they are not able to participate um, in the event today. Um, so except for a few introductory comments that I'll make in the next couple of minutes, I will be presenting material that they developed and that was presented originally in a uh, census program management review a few weeks ago. And so at the end, we will have their contact information. If you're interested in details, we'll be covering only a very light amount of uh, some very rich and very deep technical material today. Um, and so I'll try to answer a few of those questions, but you may especially want to follow up with them if you're interested in a lot of details. Um, in addition, I'll add thanks to Catherine Allen West, um, as Maggie was mentioning a moment ago, but also with thanks is a, a corresponding assignment. Catherine has available some information regarding a federal register notice. If you've not had a chance to see that, she has that electronically available, and both David and I are going to be saying a few words about that uh, federal register notice at the end. The deadline for responding to that is November 8th. We heartily encourage everybody either here in the room or uh, listening online uh, to participate and provide constructive responses. We'll say more about constructive response at the end of this presentation, uh, but very much encourage you to uh, follow up with that. A um, <clears throat> little bit of general background uh, that in many ways is echoing a number of things we were hearing both in Alfontano's original presentation today um, and uh, the first panel discussion is that, <coughs> excuse me, anytime <coughs> You have any large-scale statistical program, <coughs> in-depth work with that requires an organization to carry out complex balance of multiple dimensions um, that can generally be categorized in at least three groups. The first one is quality. That includes notions of accuracy that we'll be emphasizing later today, but also includes other dimensions that we were hearing considered earlier this morning, for example, relevance and timeliness. Second category is risk. Um, that includes the type of disclosure risk that we're going to be talking about today and a number of other dimensions of risk, for example, uh, system performance. And then third, we always have to spend a lot of time thinking about cost. That includes both the cash cost of carrying out a certain set of operations, but also involves other scarce resources that we have. For example, available timeline, keeping with some of the comments that we were hearing in the previous question session. 
about deadlines and other things like that. We'll say more about that at the end. In addition, David and I had a chance to converse a little bit about our respective presentations previously, and I think he's going to be touching on a number of those issues as well. Um, a second point uh, that I'd like to emphasize is that like most large-scale methodological innovations that you see anywhere, either in the statistical or the broader methodology world, changes that we see in disclosure avoidance procedures require us to work at an absolutely fascinating intersection of three general areas. One is what you might call general principle science. We'll see a little bit of that that we'll touch on very briefly today. Second dimension involves technological implementation. It's great to have ideas, and it's terribly important to have the scientific insights that are offered in these areas. And then you go from that to saying, and therefore, here is how we are going to have a production system that meets those quality of cri criteria of quality, risk, and cost I referred to a moment ago in a scaled uh, form. And then the third dimension, which is also terribly important, is to have very careful attention to practical impact um, that we end up having for any type of production system, in this case, the close closure avoidance uh, system. Um, it's reflected both in a combination of empirical results and also in user behavior. And some of that ties in with what Maggie was referring to a couple of minutes ago in terms of the quality of the work uh, that we end up having and the resulting data that our, our users are able to use. Again, we'll cover all of that at the end a little bit in my presentation, but also I think Dave and some of our other speakers are also going to be following up on that as well. In keeping with Al's comments at the start in his keynote address, uh, disclosure avoidance system is um, intended to ensure that the uh, 2020 decennial data products meet legal requirements related to Title 13. Um, and that is the fundamental title under which we are authorized to collect the data, but also have a corresponding obligation uh, to protect the privacy of those data. So in particular, the disclosure avoidance system, as I'll be describing it in very brief form today, uh, is intended to prevent improper disclosures of data about individuals or establishments um, in our 2020 products. Um, the longer version of this paper that was presented at the uh, census program management review covered four main concepts. Uh, purpose, what do we, why do we need a new disclosure avoidance system? Notions related to noise injection and differential privacy, state of the project, and some uh, uh, forward-looking statements. We are going to keep that relatively short, in particular those last two elements today, um, but you're welcome to look online. Uh, all those materials are available online in a great deal of depth. So instead, we're going to focus on, first of all, what's the purpose of a disclosure avoidance system? Why do we care? And the fundamental concept uh, that we, uh, motivates our work with disclosure avoidance system in general and also the version of it that we have developed for 2020 is focused on a notion of, quote, database reconstruction. Basic idea uh, is displayed in this very simple uh, graphic. On the left-hand side, we have respondent data. Those are the data that Al mentioned before that we are pledged uh, to protect. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, we have the published summary data uh, that we're going to have. And the concern that is expressed um, and summarized with the term, quote, database reconstruction is to what extent and in what ways is it possible, here's the risk, that the published summary data will allow somebody not to make aggregate inferences, that's what we want them to make uh, from the published summary data, but instead to make statements about the underlying respondent data at a micro level. That's the concern. And so we can visualize that as saying that if we saw those published data, could we, quote, reconstruct, unquote, the original responses. Um, the general notion of that goes beyond simply saying, is there one single reconstruction? But a crucial fact that we'll be developing in the next few minutes is that in most cases, and we'll put some footnotes on that in a moment, in most cases, we in fact have many different possible, quote, database reconstructions, unquote, that could be uh, essentially purported to be developed from a set of published summary data. If we have a whole lot of those, and in some ways we don't have too much in the way of information to allow people to distinguish among them, you might say we have a very large haystack and we have one needle buried in that haystack, and so, quote, our data are relatively safe, unquote. On the other hand, uh, if, and we'll get to why, we have to worry about the second case in a moment. If, in fact, uh, we have that uh, needle, in fact, very prominent within that haystack, it's not in some ways buried, um, then we have to worry 
about that a lot. That's a rough idea that we have behind database reconstruction. We'll start with a very simple case. This is intentionally oversimplified just to begin developing the idea. Suppose we have, for the moment, a publication based on some decennial census data that involve only two attributes. Uh, the first one is age. Either an individual is under 18 or they're greater than or equal to 18, in other words, voting age. And we also have them classified as being in just one of three different race categories. And suppose we have the very simple publication that we have on the right, perhaps for a certain block, that involves 10 persons living in that block. And all we report are the marginals, simply saying age is less than 18 for four individuals, greater than or equal to 18 for six. And in the same way, we have the distribution of the race classifications, as we have indicated at the bottom of uh, the bottom right-hand side of the slide. Then, in principle, a possible reconstruction of the original microdata, again looking only at the two attributes, would be what you have on the left-hand side. Maybe we have, for example, four individuals who are in race one, and the figures that we have there for relatively large and relatively small figures there are representing individuals, respectively, who are greater than or equal to 18 or less than 18. That's the notion of reconstruction. Now, as a footnote, you will also see discussion of, quote, re-identification, unquote, that would show up. Idea of re-identification is suppose you carry out that reconstruction and you say, here is a certain household. That much is reconstruction. If you then say, and that's the Elting family, that's re-identification. So that's the distinction you will see drawn in some of the literature between reconstruction and re-identification. The worry is when we focus on reconstruction is in some ways that's an initial high risk step toward re-identification. We're going to spoke almost all the attention today on reconstruction. First possible reconstruction is what I displayed a moment ago and that we now have grayed out, but that's not the only possible reconstruction. We in fact have other many, uh, large number of additional reconstructions that could be carried out, including the example that we have that we call R2 here, in which we might have, for example, four individuals all under the age of 18 in race group one, four individuals uh, over the age of 18 in race group two, four, uh, two individuals uh, over the age of 18 in race group three. It turns out that when you go through all of the resulting combinatorics for that, even in this relatively simple case, it turns out you have over 600,000 possible reconstructions based on this very simple classification that you have here. And consequently, we end up saying, if we lived in this nice, low-dimensional world and we could stay there, then we really don't have too much to worry about in terms of reconstruction. The problem is we live in a more complex world than that. And in particular, for the 2010 decennial, so we're using that in many ways as the anchor of the baseline for what we have here. In the 2010 decennial, in a certain sense, well, we did have 10 questions asked, but for an individual, we effectively have six different attributes attached to them, things like age, race, and so on like that. Um, when you go through the combinatorics for that world, it turns out that you get a variant on what uh, mathematical statisticians in the last 20-some years have been referring to as the, quote, curse of dimensionality, unquote. Essentially, the dimensionality means that you no longer can say, I have a very large, relatively large, haystack in which I'm bearing a needle, but in fact you have major problems attached to them. Here's the major problem based again on 2010 data. <clears throat> um, we have, for the purpose of discussion here, three different files that we're going to contemplate. Um, the first one is the one that's absolutely crucial in terms of redistricting. It's referred to as the PL94-171. took me a year at the Census Bureau to memorize uh, that label. Um, Bottom line there is we have over 2.7 billion, that's billion with a B, cells represented in that. It's because of the, the very fine level information that we are obligated based on the, um, based on the legal obligations that I was referring to before. We also have two other files that were published in um, 2010, uh, balance of summary file one, about 2.8 billion, um, and then summary file two with just over 2 billion. Again, huge numbers of cells attached to each of those. And on the other hand, <clears throat> you say, wait a minute, where did that come from? 
Uh, it came from a little over 300 million persons for whom we were collecting information. Uh, six attributes, as I was saying before, that we, we were referring to. So you say, wait a minute, uh, we have effectively the collected statistics in this sense, about 1.8 billion um, numbers, uh, figures that we have. But we have effectively, in parallel with that, uh, something over 7 billion, effectively, equations. Go back to algebra, and you say, wait a minute, I have uh, essentially um, 1.8 billion unknowns, I have 7.7 .7 billion equations, and pretty quickly you say I have an overdetermined system. I, in fact, am at serious risk of, in fact, being able to, quote, reconstruct, unquote, that. There's a whole lot of detail behind that, but that's roughly the intuitive idea. Again, the dimensionality is the crucial factor. Uh, in that. This has been well known for a number of decades and as a result of that over the course of time uh, the Census Bureau has made major efforts to try to address this. In 2010 two primary tools that were used were aggregation and swapping. And for 2020 the focus is instead going to be on noise injection and a related set of tools that are referred to as differential privacy. Um, the basic idea behind noise injection is that, in effect, you're going to take the information that you have at that fine uh, level of aggregation and you're going to, quote, perturb it, unquote, in certain types of structured <coughs> ways, but not the same kind of structure that we saw with perturbation in 2010. Differential privacy, then, is a body of tools. I won't go into the details of it here. But the basic idea it's, is that it's a way for us to effectively control the resulting trade-offs we have between the two crucial factors that Maggie was referring to in her introductory remarks. One is how well are we protecting privacy? Again, dealing with the needle in the haystack idea that we referred to before. Effectively, by injecting noise, we're no longer having people even sure what is the needle that they're finding in the haystack if they find it. And on the other hand, the question of accuracy. We have to have a high, de high level of utility for certain purposes of the data we put out. That's the whole reason we're doing it to begin with. Um, you will typically see in this literature a set of trade-offs that are characterized by the type of curve that I was displaying here. And I won't go again into the details of it, but I'll highlight three main points. First of all, if you were to live in the upper right-hand corner of this graph, you were living on a point in, in that curve, up near that upper right-hand corner, it's essentially a place at which you are adding very little noise. So you're back in your exercise I was describing a moment ago about we're really not doing a very good job of hiding the needle in the haystack anymore. So you have effectively a high level of privacy loss. But on the other hand, uh, you are in fact providing uh, data at a relatively fine level with a very high level of accuracy. On the other hand, if you live in the far left-hand corner, you effectively are in, in uh, the opposite situation. You've, you've in fact prov uh, provided a very high degree of protection a lot of noise in your data. You provide a high level of protection, but on the other hand, you have very poor quality data, very low level of accuracy for the information uh, that you're providing. Um, differential privacy is a set of tools that we have for helping us to understand those trade-offs. Obviously, you'd like to live somewhere between those two extremes, and there's a lot of further information um, that um, a, lot, a lot of further information that we can consider in that. Um, let's have a quick show of hands here. How many of you in the audience are primarily survey methodologists? Any? I can see a few hands. Let me mention something in passing. The assessment that we have about where ought we to be living on this curve depends in a very fundamental way on trying to understand effectively the utility that is attached both to individuals, individuals all 308 million or so of us as of 2010, that we attach to certain types of privacy protections, and on the other hand, the utility also that we attribute. Uh, to a certain level of accuracy of the information that we're distributing. Um, one of many areas of research that would be extremely valuable for um, uh, us to have further insights from our colleagues in the academic community as well as the private sector and, and in the government is to understand more about ways in which we can elicit a clear understanding of utility in these very case-specific cases. It's effectively what the Federal Register notice that I referenced before is trying to get at in terms of surface and use cases. But there's also some very interesting methodological issues related to this. Um, for example, about a dozen years ago, Tony O'Hagan and many co-authors, co-editors, had a really interesting book on a listation of utility functions and priors. How do we take those sorts of notions and also some related <clears throat> me, some related uh, software has been developed by David Spiegelhalter and others. How do we take either those tools or related concepts and try to use those in a structured way to, in fact, take notional development of use cases 
and in fact get ourselves with much better insights about where we want to live on this curve. That's just one of many areas of both methodological and also engineering insights that we would very much benefit from. The resulting disclosure avoidance system, once the decision is made about where we want to live on that curve, um, is summarized very briefly in this, uh, in, in this graph. Um, it's essentially a variance on what I was displaying before, but with a little more detail. Idea, once again, is in the red area that we have on the left. These are where we have confidential data inside the Census Bureau, the original decennial response file, as well as uh, various levels of unedited and then subsequently edited files. On the right, we have our, our released for, um, information that we have. Again, for example, our PL94171 data, as well as uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, supplementary files one and two, and prospectively special tabulations as well. And again, sitting in the middle, we have a disclosure avoidance system. There's a, a fundamental tuning constant referred to as epsilon that's crucial to um, uh, differential privacy calculations. De making decisions on that then effectively ends up saying, how do we tune that middle box that we have in our work? Now, there are both advantages and disadvantages of differential privacy approaches relative to the swapping that was used in 2010. Uh, for example, uh, privacy guarantees can be much more, quote, tunable and provable. Uh, they're also, in some sense, future use. They are not, in uh, some sense, assessed relative to what type of external data are currently available in the outside environment. And that's a crucial factor. If you go back through much of the disclosure literature over the 30-some years, uh, often much of that is essentially conditional upon what else is available um, already in the external environment. Um, privacy guarantees can be explainable um, and, and placed in the public domain uh, and provides a reasonable degree of protection against database reconstruction. But there are disadvantages. Um, and in particular, the entire country effectively has to be processed once to be the most efficient that you possibly can be in there. Um, and also there's a set of calculations referred to as a privacy loss budget every time we release <coughs> additional information we're essentially having to charge it to that. And if we have a finite budget attached to that, we have to be very careful about that. Going back to saying a little bit more about engagement with all of our colleagues um, in academia, the private sector, um, and other government agencies, the intention is to make the entire disclosure avoidance system place it in the public domain. Open source uh, data, we very much, uh, excuse me, open source code, we very much hope uh, that our colleagues will in fact look at those and provide, I, we hope, a whole lot of improvements and that, that will found, form a basis for a great deal of enrichment of the disclosure avoidance literature. In addition, as we heard referenced before, uh, we do ultimately have data, Census Bureau data, excuse me, decennial census data released uh, into the public domain, in particular 1940 data at present are now fully in the public domain. As a result of that, we very much hope people will be able to use either this disclosure avoidance system or anything else that they may wish to have. Use that, apply it to the 1940 data. We hope that provides a very rich test bed for a very energetic discussion of a whole lot of pluses and minuses and again, how we can improve these data over time. Uh, finally, as I mentioned at the start, there's a federal register notice that has a deadline of comment for November 8th. We heartily encourage everybody here to respond, and in particular respond with concrete use cases to help us understand as much as we possibly can about where you view high priorities to be uh, in terms of particular data products that are prospectively coming out of the 2020 census. Thank you. I'm having so much fun tweeting about this. I forgot I have to come up here and introduce our next speaker. Uh, um, so uh, our next speaker um, is David Johnson, who many of you know. He's a research professor here at ISR in the Survey Research Center, and he is director of the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. Prior to coming um, to Michigan, David had a long history of service in the federal statistical system, where he was um, uh, chief Economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis and before that Chief of the Social Economic and Housing Statistics Division of the U.S. Census Bureau and I believe he also had a stay at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, so he, is, he has a, a broad vision of the federal statistical system. He also hails from a, a Big Ten school um, with a PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota. David. Thanks, Maggie. Um, so I'm going to try to um, 
not talk about big data or no privacy, but I'm going to sort of, in the honor of Halloween, talk about the guy, the scary guy with the mask, which is um, represents disclosure avoidance. And I'm hoping to um, convince you that it might not be as bad as we think. Um, I'm going to take you through, uh, I was going to say walk you through, but I'll probably run given, given the time, sort of take you why we need disclosure avoidance. That's sort of building on what John said. Um, why I think the current methods at Census Bureau might be problematic and we might want to change them, and why this new idea of noise infusion or noise injection might not be as scary as we, as we think. So why do we need it? Well, I think it all starts with Title 13. So as, as John said, um, Title 13 is the law that governs the privacy. Back in the 1950s, it's been there. It's also the law that prevents us Census Bureau from sharing the data with other agencies for any other reason but statistical purposes. Um, and the three big things that you look at, like John mentioned, Section 9, the one we really focus on is make any publication whereby the data furnished by any individual under this title can be identified. So that's the key. And the interpretation by Census is that identification doesn't have to be identifying my family, but basically reconstructing the data. And because of that, census can't then share the rules they use to adjust the data for disclosure, because then that would be reconstruction or re-identification. And there are penalties of, of $250,000. Most of us might be a special sworn status census employee that have to abide by these rules. So this is also <coughs> what protects the Census Bureau from sharing whatever, if you have immigration data with other agencies to do anything, as the first clause says, anything but for statistical purposes. So that's the key guiding factor. So it's all the interpretation of Title 13 of what we mean by identifying somebody, and that's left to the Census Bureau to ensure that there's no identification. The other thing is, there are other things out there. There are many reports that have been done that says we should really update our methods of, of privacy, uh, of uh, disclosure avoidance and privacy protection. And the fact that Google uses it, that's a big, big draw. Um, so there's this one thing called the funnel, I'm going to skip that one. So the, the, the key is there are a couple of committees. One is the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking, and they suggested that, we, that census and the federal statistical system um, more broadly have to adopt state-of-the-art database, cryptography, privacy-preserving, and privacy-enhancing technologies. So that's the goal. That's what's recommended by a bipartisan commission. There's also the National Academy of Sciences that comes out of the, the CMSTAT committee that, 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 that was mentioned before. Um, that Bob Groves chaired, that research with academia and industry have to continue to develop new techniques. So we have to work with academia to develop these new techniques. And that federal agencies should adopt these modern techniques. So this is the impetus of doing this new method of disclosure. Now what is differential privacy? Well, from, from the literature, it's basically the promise that you will not be affected, adversely or otherwise, by allowing your data to be used in any study or analysis, no matter what other studies, data sets, or information sources are available. So the idea that census has to protect your data, right, and take into account all the other data that's out there that might be used to identify you. So this is the rub, right? So if census releases any publication, any tabulation, you can use other data to try to identify people in there, and that's census responsibility. They've said they've shared that. So the, other, the next step is this epsilon differential privacy, which suggests the probability of identification changes by only epsilon. So to me, this is a big deal. Census Bureau usually was, you can't do anything. You have to mask every single identification. So the, the acknowledgment here is there's actually a probability of identification anyway. But you can't, the probability is never zero. There's always something there. And I think that's a big step, I think, for all of us in this new sense of disclosure. So how do we do it currently, or how the census do it currently, or how did I do it when I was there? Um, it, I think John mentioned this, uh, aggregation. So we only release stuff at high levels. So this is why when you get microdata, you only get a Puma identification of an area. That's a public use microdata area that has to be over 100,000 people. Because the idea is if you can identify a, an area under 100,000, you might be able to figure out who those people are. You swap, so this could be you swap people across areas, or you could actually swap characteristics too, okay? 
And then you top or bottom code. We all know that. You can't have income over 150. That's just top coded. All you see is 150. Then the next two are the new ones. You're adding noise to responses, or you're creating synthetic data. And I'll mention those two um, in turn. So John talked about this. Obviously, aggregation and swapping. And again, swapping can be either across areas or across characteristics. We could swap the age of people or change the age or change something else. And that can be problematic, and I'll show how it can be problematic if you're swapping based on those 10 characteristics in the decennial, and then you match the decennial data to some other external data that has other characteristics. So swapping, uh, swapping a couple people who might, by, by race, might have big impacts on what their income happened to be. And I'll show how that happens. Well, this is, John mentioned this point about there's 25 estimates per person. Just imagine what you could do if you had a, if you had a, a problem where you had that much data, you could re-identify or reconstruct anything you want. And that's what I think Census Bureau has shown. You can reconstruct the data. So here's the example of where disclosure has gone wrong. So this is a paper done by Trent Alexander, who's here at ISR, and Betsy Stevenson, who's at Ford School, along with Mike Davern, where they looked at the data that was published, the census PUMS file, the 5%, that's only 5%, linked it to the actual data in the RDC and found out that the, the ratio of men and women between the public data and the internal data was goofy after age 65. And this was all due to disclosure techniques to, to hide those people. But it was the disclosure technique was done in such a way that the cells we're concerned about at Census Bureau were the five-year cells, so it's 65 to 70. So you can see that some of this would average out, but some of the doof, goofy stuff occurs at these lower levels of, of age group. So they found this, in the, in the, and this is in the decennial census, the 2000 census, but they also found it in the, the ACS, and the CPS, and you can see that for ages 62 to 64, they're all pretty close, the ratios, but at 65 and 66, they're all over the place. And the CPS is probably the worst. And the ACS is, is bad in, in green, but the CPS is also bad, and at the time, I was running the CPS. So because of this adjustment, we had to re-release all the poverty estimates for people over 65, because it changed for men and women, the poverty estimates were impacted. And this was based on a current disclosure technique that I can't talk about and I can't tell you what it is. And this is the rub. And so this is the rub for census. So it would be great if census can say, hey, our previous method was so bad, I'll show you how bad it is. They can't do that because that risks the violation of Title 13 of re-identification. The example of success is a recent um, product done by Raj Chetty, Nathaniel Hendren, and Jones and Porter, who were at Census Bureau, where they took the census data and then linked it to the tax data that Raj does, and they create this opportunity atlas. So this is basically, here's the income when you were a kid, and here's the income now when you're an adult. And they mapped it all across the country for every census track. Okay? Well, the problem is, when they did the linking, they realize that they can't release the data using the internal data. They have to use the disclosure avoidance data. So if this would be the swap data or other things. So if you can imagine, some of these areas down in the south, when you swap them based on age, race, um, family type, you could be swapping people who have completely different incomes. And so they found when they did the swapping and they released the data, the results were different from what they had with the internal data. However, when they do the differential privacy noise infusion, they could keep a lot of the same relationships. So they could do it in such a way that you can keep a lot more of those correlations depending on how you built in the differential privacy. This is, so this is a success of how they did it. Now again, we can't know how bad it was before, and this is the problem. So this sort of gets to what I think um, we should do as researchers. So as John said, here's the simple graph. I just stole this from the CSAC presentation um, of trade-off between accuracy and privacy, right? So again, right, the more accuracy you get, the less privacy you're going to have. And we want to find out what epsilon to choose. What's that best privacy budget, privacy loss budget. So if I'm an economist, I have a linear map, I do a trade-off, I maximize it at that social optimum or the larger social benefit of So I can do that. 
The problem is we have no clue what an estimated production technology looks like, right? It could look like this, which would be much better for us in terms of accuracy and privacy. I wouldn't have to trade off nearly as much accuracy as privacy. So we don't know what the loss of accuracy does. You know, I'm, I'm certain that most of the researchers, anybody who does actual regressions and research using only the 2010 decennial should get another job. They should, for, there's only 10 variables. So they're not going to find much, okay? And I can't imagine that the stuff you're going to find is really going to impact the results depending on how you noise infuse that. But if you're going to link it to other things, there could be some other things going on. I also can't imagine any of us, and this is what John was getting at, any of us complaining that somebody could look at me, look at the census, and figure out, oh, he's white, he's a man, he's 60, and he's married, and his kids don't live there. That's what you get in the decennial. So again, there's not much, that privacy loss might not be that big for the decennial. So this is what we need people's help on, is to estimate those two things. There are issues with differential privacy, as um, Bob and, 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 and Brian have looked at. Um, there's no way to get around the fundamental law of information recovery, which is basically the more and more data we have, we're going to be able to find you. There's no way to get around that, right? Even differential privacy is not going to get around that. It's just going to set, it's just going to set parameters on the estimates. Um, there's really no difference between multiple releases and synthetic data sets, so we could release all these other data sets as we want, but again, eventually you might be able to figure out um, who these people are. Uh, there's no way to see the raw data. Now, this is, what the, this is I think, the biggest criticism people are really concerned about. Well, I don't get to see what the real data are. Well, you never get to see what the real data are, right, as Trent showed. They're, 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 you just don't get to see it, right? In fact, the decennial, you only get to see 5% sample. It could be with the differential privacy, you could, re, re, you could actually get the entire 100% census data just perturbed a bit. Um, there are also problems with outliers. Um, they may require larger sample sizes. Again, I think the sample size is a big deal here. And it introduces statistical noise. Again, a lot of us are not comfortable with a data set that has quote unquote noise in it. And it's not clear to me, having been there and seen what we did to perturb some of the data, it's not just it's noise, it's noise imposed by individual people, interpretation of what we think would hide people. Whereas differential privacy, you'll actually hear, here it is, here's the epsilon, here's the shock of noise, go at it, right? And you'll be able to adjust your standard errors, you'll be able to do everything with the differential privacy. Um, the big issue, and I think it's hidden in this, is this idea of a privacy budget. So we talked about that epsilon, so this one turns out to be 2.5, what that means. But 2.5 means that's, that's the total, right? So if I have 2.5 and I'm going to release a national estimate, a state estimate, a county estimate, a tract estimate, a block estimate, and a microdata estimate with all these pumas, I have to add up all those epsilons and all of those have to be less than 2.5. So this is the problem. So if I have this and then I want to release a linked data set with the tax data, and kind of through public use data, that's going to have to also be under this epsilon. So the key is, and this is again, what you could reply on the federal register notice, who's going to decide what epsilon? Is it epsilon 10, 2.5, 86? I, I don't know. Who's going to decide that? And I think that's where we need, uh, where census needs, uh, in my opinion, us as researchers to sort of say, where are we along these spectrums? And how will this affect other, other data sets? So let me take a couple minutes to talk about synthetic data. So synthetic data, so there are two, two ways to do this. You can shock the estimates you get, and I think that's what John was showing. You shock the track. So in that area, you know the distribution of these characteristics. Or you can actually shock the internal microdata that's used to create. And this is, census has been doing this for a long time. So these are four different areas where they do this. On the map is the biggest one. Then the Longview Business Database is one where they actually shock the microdata. The SAPI is a small area estimate which actually is used to allocate Title I funding. So here's where they're using a shocked model-based estimate based on the underlying data to actually allocate funds. So it's, it, there's already, it's already done. And then my favorite is the SIP synthetic file, which is the SIP linked to all your Social Security earnings records back to the 1950s. We can find your entire life, but we have to shock that to make it 
um, able to be released. And if you look at it, it you, it's not that bad. And I think that's is where I think the data set's going. So on the, on the SSB results, it's basically this shock, this, this synthetic data, where they looked at the distribution of share of household income earned by the wife. There's a sharp cliff at half. So when you hit half, where between husband and wife, um, there's a big jump between the, the percentage shares. And if you look at the internal results, you also get the jump. It's a bigger jump. But what you could do is you could do your analysis on the synthetic data, send the code, and this is what they exactly did, to the Census Bureau. They would run on the internal data, and you could walk away and say, hey, I get the same results, or they're very close, or I'm comfortable using the synthetic data. So what can you do? So the first thing is you respond to this federal register notice. And again, this matters. So I've been there a number of times. I've had to answer these. There was a question on the ACS that was actually retained and not changed because 300 people, organized by Steve Ruggles, sent in 300 letters that basically said the same thing. So if you answer this and say, hey, you know, we need these tabulations. We need this data. We want the raw data. Whatever you want to do, it definitely matters because they have to read all these and respond to every single one. The other thing is you can participate in these advisory committees. So you go to CSAC or you go to COPAFS or APTU. So COPAFS is the Council of Professional Associations of Federal Statistics, APTU Association for Public Data Users. Go to the meetings. Make your voice assert. Don't just sit and complain about it. Oh, I'm going to get my data. Right? Provide suggestions. Talk to census staff constantly and do it like you should vote, early and often. And then Research this idea of accuracy. Be very specific about the effects of, of, of this privacy, of these adjustments, of what this is going to do to the accuracy of your data. We have no idea what this does, but you could research this and figure this out. And the final thing is, and this is a big deal, the problem with disclosure is people don't know what it is. So you go talk to Census Bureau, and I think trying to experience this, you can't get a straight answer, and you can't get answers from people because they don't know what the disclosure is. So if you said, I got this result, but I can't tell you because I'm sworn under Title 13. So if you can train all the census staff and train all of us of how to use this new noise infusion or new synthetic or whatever you want to call it, I think that's the key. And this is also came out of the, the report by Bob Groves, is that we have to train everybody on these new techniques. Thank you. So thank you, David. Um, I think we will we'll, we will somehow um, make sure that everybody has the link to the RFI so that you can submit. Um, I, I think um, to the Census Bureau um, your your feedback on the kinds of information that the Census Bureau should be making available from Census 2020 um, and other data products. One thing I will say is that what I've heard over and over again is that it's really important for researchers and others to articulate the use cases that you have. What is it that you want this tabulation, this kind of data for? And how much, you know, how disaggregated, how much noise could you live with? Because how much of the privacy budget should get used up for this particular use case depends on what you need to have the, um, the data be useful for that particular purpose. And if we just say we want more data, we're less likely, I think, to get an effective um, response than if we say these are the use cases for which we need this kind of disaggregation or this little noise. Um, so I really urge people to um, uh, to respond to that. Our last speaker is someone who's going to talk to us, I think, about another way of uh, managing the privacy, uh, privacy issues related to the Census Bureau, and that is um, Joelle Abramovitz. Um, Joelle is an assistant research scientist here at the Survey Research Center. She came to us also from the U.S. Census Bureau in 2016. She is the co-director of the Michigan Federal Statistical Research Data Center, um, and she has a Ph.D. in economics not from a Big Ten school, um, <laughs> from the University of Washington. Go out. I didn't plan that Big Ten. It's a Pac Ten. It's a Pac Ten school, so you know, <laughs> me and the Rose Bowl together. <laughs> if we still had a decent football system, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks.
Maggie. Thanks for having me today. So as Maggie mentioned, today I'll be talking about what I think is a critical component in thinking about this question about privacy and data. So we know, especially as researchers, that both data access and protecting privacy are important. Federal agencies administer, administer censuses and surveys and collect information from administrative records. These activities produce a wealth of information that is used in a myriad of ways, from community planning to academic research. Safeguarding the information of individuals and firms providing these data is a priority. RDCs, which I'll be talking about today, facilitate access to restricted data while protecting privacy. To balance access to data and privacy, some data are made available publicly, while others are only made available on a restricted basis. Federal Statistical Research Data Centers, which I'll call RDCs, were established to provide access to the restricted data. RDCs enabled qualified researchers with approved projects to access confidential, unpublished data from the federal statistical system. This quote from a former U.S. Census Bureau director about RDCs, this research data center allows us to engage researchers outside of Washington in using this very important data while also protecting the public's right to privacy. Now I'll tell you a little bit about how RDCs protect privacy. RDCs provide access to restricted census data as well as data from other federal statistical agencies. Each RDC is a secure facility. All RDC research output goes through a rigorous disclosure avoidance review process to ensure that no confidential information is released. Each RDC is staffed by a Census Bureau employee. And each RDC is part of a greater network of RDCs. The network includes 29 RDCs around the country. RDCs are joint projects of the US Census Bureau and their home institutions. So we have one here at Michigan in the basement of this building, and it is a joint project of the Census Bureau and the University of Michigan. Here's a map of all the RDCs around the country, the existing locations in blue and uh, locations in development in red. And by having this network across the country, RDCs facilitate collaboration across locations so that researchers in different places can be working on the same project. And as researchers move across their careers, that they can still be involved in this research and not be tied to one location. Working in an RDC provides access to data that are just not available elsewhere. Some data, in particular, are just not available publicly at all. These include establishment level business data, as well as linked household and firm data. Some data are available publicly, but the restricted versions provide more detailed information. These might include detailed geospatial variables. Uh, there's also virtually no top or bottom, bottom coding in the RDC. And also in the RDC, it's possible to link data to other non-census data. The RDCs provide Census Bureau data and increasingly data from other federal agencies. So while they started with only census data, um, with data like the decennial census and demographic surveys, um, also data from economic censuses and surveys, and linked business and household data, they've now expanded their scope to include data from other agencies, like the National Center for Health Statistics and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which have included their public health survey data in the RDCs, as well as the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which has included some of their labor survey data in the RDCs. And it's an exciting time that more agencies are looking to join the RDC system in the future. In addition to these different data sets, RDCs also facilitate linkage of different data products, providing unique research opportunities. These include linked business and household data, as well as linked survey and administrative data. And 
in addition to all of these survey products, there are also a number of projects coming out of these sorts of linkages that are available in the RDC. An exciting piece about the RDC is that they promote broader access to data than before. RDCs are accessible by any academic. The application process is transparent. RDC administrators and agency analysts assist researchers in preparing their applications. There's an increasing emphasis on timely review. When we think about how do we protect privacy in the system, there are a number of requirements for accessing the data. So while they are available broadly, there are requirements to ensure privacy. One of these is that any researcher looking to use data in an RDC must submit a research proposal. That would go to the federal agency that is responsible for those data. In addition, once that proposal was approved, they also have to obtain special sworn status. So access is restricted to Census Bureau employees or researchers who have special sworn status with the Census Bureau. To do that, the researcher must either be a US citizen or have lived in the US for three years. And those obtaining special sworn status must obtain security clearance and must sign and make a sworn statement about preserving the confidenti confidentiality of the data for life. So it's not just during the time that they're working with the data, but um, that even when they are no longer working in the RDC, that they can't release any um, restricted information. As a result of access to these non-public data, um, this access has enabled innovative research published in leading academic journals. So just some topics that are relevant to current news and policy conversations. Our researchers have assessed residential mobility and the geographic distribution of the healthy. They're able to do that because they have access to more detailed geographic information in the restricted data. Our researchers have examined the relationship between environmental em emissions and health outcomes. They have quantified the impact of maternal access to the birth control pill on child poverty. And they've investigated the effects of interactions with international markets on US per firm performance using data on businesses that just wouldn't be available elsewhere. And these are just, just a sample of a wide variety of research that has come out of our RDC. So in summary, the RDC network is a vital resource for providing data access while protecting privacy. It reduces the amount and scope of publicly available data to protect privacy. So when we think about the private privacy budget that David and John were talking about, in this way there are fewer estimates being released, but researchers can still work with data in a protected space. It permits access to restricted data in a secure and controlled manner to facilitate important research. RDCs are increasingly necessary as additional differential privacy measures are implemented. And understanding the role of RDCs can be valuable in helping the public have confidence in the confidentiality of their responses to federal censuses and surveys, which is important as we think back to our earlier panel in, having, in helping people have confidence when they answer the census. Thank you so much. We, we are not surprisingly running over, um, but we'll try and uh, take time for a few questions if people have questions of our speakers. Thank you. Just linking Joelle's uh, presentation to the others, just, just to clarify, are there any implications of the, of the differential privacy steps that are being taken and the RDCs, or yeah. are we... Short answer is what uh, David and I were both referring to briefly about you have a fixed privacy budget and then you have to allocate it 
anything in quotes that's released, and that anything includes, for example, anything that comes out of an RDC um, is included with that. One of the critical factors, though, is that often within an RDC, you will have somebody carrying out in-depth analyses um, in, in a whole lot of different ways, but for example, diagnostic plots, other things like that, that they will then not be intending to release to the public except uh, in a summary form. For example, uh, you know, for example, we carried out a careful analysis of this and we did not find unusual outliers or something like that. Um, as opposed to having to actually release the graphs themselves, which could, especially if you're doing outlier detection or something like that, uh, could involve a lot of, quote, leakage, unquote, of information. Um, and so in some ways, uh, we believe that the RDCs uh, are an important component of, in some ways, managing that total epsilon, because eventually, if most of what you're releasing from there are highly aggregated results, for example, uh, you know, say coefficients or other model parameter estimates, um, and some relatively modest information about uncertainty like standard errors or, or confidence sets or something like that. Um, that is some leakage, but it's not nearly as much as if you're having to drop a whole lot of a uh, very large number of tables or something like that in the public. So as I understand, the raw reported data will be in the RDCs, just the estimates you take out have to be disclosed. And I don't think the Census Bureau has figured out how to how to disclose, disclosure adjust regression coefficients. That I think they, I think they know the estimate of the, of the cell estimates, but I don't think, from my understanding, I don't know if there's a way to do the regression coefficients. But yeah, so I was going to say I think that I was just going to add one other thing, which is that one thing which I have heard, at least from John About, is that right now we have in this there is there are disclosure protections on the data that are in the census RDCs that there is some swapping and some um, and um, and things like that, uh, and that once we have implemented differential privacy and figured out kind of how to add a little bit of noise to, you know, and how um, to, you know, your maximum likelihood estimates, which don't use up much of the privacy budget, probably don't need very much noise. Once we know how to do that, then we will actually be able to use completely unprotected, that is say unswapped, unkept, unperturbed <coughs> data in the RDCs, which will allow the S will have, we will solve the problem not by distorting the underlying data, but by adding a little bit of noise to the output, um, which I think is a better solution than messing with the underlying data when we don't know exactly what the implications of that will be for the subsequent analysis. So I think right now, for anybody who's working in the RDCs knows that this is a challenge because there's a lot of uncertainty around disclosure um, from the RDCs. But I think in the long run, um, it actually makes the RDCs both more important um, in terms of um, uh, in terms of helping to reduce the use of use of the privacy budget, but also um, al allows them to actually offer a higher quality access to data. I, this is uh, Rod, Rod Little here. Um, it's a very complicated area, I say. I've, I've done a bit of research on uh, disclosure avoidance, and uh, developing the methods is, is much easier than figuring out the trade-offs and the risks. But um, I, I've always had a feeling that, that uh, a noise injection is kind of a clunky way of doing it, and uh, swapping is also a kind of clunky way of doing it, uh, and sort of creating uh, synthetic data um, with, um, with by modeling essentially by modeling the data and then seems seems seem, seem like a more promising avenue to me for dealing with issues. I, I don't know if the panelists have any opinions about that. But. By the way, I, I did invent a method that I thought had a very good acronym. So, so getting good acronyms is also important. So, I had a method called synthetic multiple imputation of keys, which. Uh, which becomes Smike, who is the character in Dickens who was stealing stuff. So I, thought, I always loved the acronym. <laughs> yep. um, I don't have an immediate uh, overall response to that in any meaningful depth. Uh, it's obviously an empirical question to a very large degree, and that's an example where, as I was referring to at the start, you have a certain body of methodology and technology that is a certain level of, of development. Uh, that's a snapshot of what we have now. We hope in X years we have something much more refined in exploring a lot of the venues, uh, of the options that um, Rod was referring to a moment ago, and understanding in a much more nuanced way uh, where the benefits uh, and risks are attached to each of those uh, is going to be, we believe, one of the real benefits that we have from doing ongoing research and getting collaboration with everybody across sectors. 
And I'm a, I'm a fan of synthetic data, so yeah. I, mean, I didn't I, show my theorem. Yeah. I, I believe there's a finite set of models and a micro data set, there exists a synthetic data set that yields the similar results as the original data set. So the key is, how many of these do we have to make, or do they have to make, and can they do it on the fly? But I, I think that's the way to go. But. I also, I mean, I, I, what I thought Dave was, was, was going to say is I, that, that there's really, these are, these are complements, not substitutes, right? So having synthetic data out there in the public that can be where you can reproduce the results or try to reproduce the results inside an RDC, um, that then, and then the results that come out of that are differentially private. Those are, those are actually allow greater access while still maintaining scientific utility. All right, and I will stop answering. Other questions? Lisa? I believe in the first presentation there was reference that this needs to be done at the national level, or it's best to be done that way, but my recollection of the release of the PL94171 data is it trickled out several states at a time. So how can you do that? Um, uh, uh, more refined way of saying it is it should be done at an omnibus level for, quote, all, unquote, of the releases you're intending to do. Uh, that's, it's somewhat distinct from saying if we are releasing these on a certain schedule, we need to have a, uh, and they're the structure we have for privacy budgets, um, it is going to be more efficient from a statistical and, and again, risk privacy trade-off uh, point of view if we effectively allocate that budget ahead of time and say this much of the budget goes to and then specify things. David had a nice breakout of that in terms of subsequent um, uh, several different components uh, that one could contemplate with that. But you have, to, you have to have a clear idea of what each of those components are as opposed to somebody two years after the fact coming back in and saying, oh, we have the following pressing additional need if you have not accounted for that in your privacy budget a priori, uh, for example, if you had a natural disaster or something like that, and we now need a separate breakout, then that would have to be handled separately. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I had a question back to the PL94171 data, and <laughs> we love that here. Uh, so obviously the, uh, the citizenship question will, the data produced from that will be part of that because that will be used for redistricting purposes. Uh, I had a question for related to disclosure, to disclosure prevention for that. Uh, so if it's released at the block level, there are something like six million populated census blocks. The median size um, in terms of population is 23, median households 10. Uh, about 10% of census blocks, populated census blocks, only have one household. Um, Getting back to the data sharing with other agencies, uh, I, I don't expect that the, the underlying data will be shared, but to what extent can you kind of ensure that some entrepreneurial data scientist at DHS won't take their, their visa data for where um, non-citizen residents are living, uh, geolocate that, and then connect it to the uh, um, I don't have anything to add to that except Al's comment at the, in, during his presentation about uh, the, pre the citizenship issue is currently subject to litigation and therefore we're pretty much falling sail on that. Al or James, do you have anything more you want to add to that? There, we are doing, having very narrow discussions about what the PL file will look like from 2020, but there's no decisions yet made. so. Um, the only thing we have decided on is what we are doing for the prototype data file that's going to be released in March, which is coming off the 2018 test, and obviously there was no citizenship question there. Um, but it's uh, our assumption, I think, that uh, the this disclosure avoidance techniques that are being developed through differential privacy are going to protect the microdata, uh, micro detail file, and then any tabulations off of that will have that protection already applied to it. All right, if there are no other questions, thank you guys all for coming. We will put all the information, slides, videos, everything on our website. We're at isr.umich.edu. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, no, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get started for our next session system once the decision is made about where we want to live on that curve um, is summarized very